Podtacular, the unofficial Halo Universe podcast presents episode 555, Machine and Cinema, recorded live on October 4th, 2016. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Podtacular, the unofficial Halo Universe podcast. I'm your host, Dust Storm. I'm your co-host, Godzilla T. And we are here for a very special episode of the podcast tonight. We have been trying to get this going for a little while, and we're happy to finally get this podcast underway. But it is our Machinima show that we've been trying to get going for a while now. And we have quite a panel of guests on for tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, Steven or Digital Virus from the channel Retro Digital. Howdy. Hello, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. We also have Digital Infinity, also from Retro Digital. Hello. Hello, welcome. We also have uh, John, I believe, who is just spectating, <laughs> also from, I guess, Retro Digital. Hey, baby cakes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm from around the block, <laughs> aka Retro Digital. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, we have uh, the great Isaiah on as well. Hey, what's up? Hey, nice to have you on. Uh, you, you actually had some stuff that we showed case during our Spartans for Troops stream. Yeah, that was really cool. I wish I could have watched it. I I don't. We have. I don't know if we put a vod up or not. If if not, we we definitely had the plans to do it. I need. That's something you probably should, should go back and check. Yeah, I would love it if you did that. And then we also have Evan Royalty, who's kind of helps alongside from what I understand of Retro Digital. Uh, content. Uh, he's his own. He's his own oh, separate entity. I hate but literally we... every single person in this call right now. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and then we also have uh, Pep on as Hola. well. Hello. Como estas? Uh, bien, bien. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so we are going to be talking a little bit about Machinima specifically in Halo Five. Obviously, we've had Machinima come around since Halo One, starting off with a few kind of main channels including red versus blue um there was also the warthog jump videos which kind of was the start of machinima as most people know it and it's kind of evolved now to what we have with halo 5 so obviously halo 5 has some really cool things added to it with the forge and stuff and um difference of machinima stuff and it kind of had a rough start with the launch of halo 5 so we're going to kind of go over some of that and also go through some of the processes from these folks on how they make their machinima, what it takes to actually make a stage and forge and come up with a storyline to uh, showcase in their machinimas and all that stuff. So it's something that I think is, I think personally pretty fascinating and interesting. And I hope that everyone listening to this thinks so at the end of this as well. So uh, as tradition here on the podcast, we usually like to go through a little bit of the history of all of our guests on the show. And I know that we have quite a few, so I want to kind of keep this brief. But I just wanted to go through everybody and kind of get a short synopsis of how you got interested in Halo in the first place, what Halo you came in on, and what got you interested in making Halo 5 Machinima. So we'll go ahead and start with Digital Virus. Thanks, Dustin. Um, so I got into Machinima back in 2007 when Halo 3 came out. Um, my buddy called me up and he said, hey, I just bought a capture card. And at the time, I didn't know what that was. So he invited me over to his house and then he showed me how it worked. And, and then he showed me uh, some of the works that other people had done. And one of my primary influences, as everybody already knows, is uh, stems from digital fear which is from vast majority of the people from uh, my generation stems from digital fear or uh, dark null. Uh, those are my primary two for uh, suspense, like drawing for, like for, uh, for storytelling for suspense purposes and action. Um, ob obviously the primary uh, action would have been from uh, dark null. Um, so I got into it then. And at the time that's kind of when, uh, Machinima had their director program and everybody was reaching to get a, a, a signed contract with them. So then you could get, you know, like that director title. Uh, and that's what also kind of drove me because of the people that I looked up to were uh, had, were, were part of the director program. Um, 
it was a lot harder then because people were really critical about other people's work. So uh, like a lot of people would talk down to you depending on like your quality of work. So having people to look up to like Digital Fear or Dark Null was a, a big help uh, for people from my generation because we strive to be like them and be eventually better than they are um, in our own craft. Uh, and then I got partnered with Damon Productions and with them, I made my first standalone uh, Halo Machinima, which was in Halo Reach called and, uh, Halo Legacy and Girona, which blew up and got me noticed throughout the uh, our part of the Machinima community. And then from there, uh, uh, since Machinima is no longer doing the director program um, later on and that part of the timeline, which if you want, we could touch base on that later, um, everyone just kind of went independent. So I started doing my own stuff, um, which stemmed into you know dawn of the titans i'd always wanted to make a an action machinima series kind of like the forgotten spartans uh and a lot of the inspiration behind dawn of the titans stemmed from the forgotten spartans and caused it to also tie into its universe and the universe of rise of the spartans as well um and then really trying to focus on how i could uh, bring more of a visual aesthetic to machinima um, which is why like most of my content is primarily like a, uh, a visual experience. Um, so I, I will always try my best to figure out how I could um, do my best to kind of raise the bar when it came to like uh, visual representations with in that part of the community. Um, and now I just kind of don't really do anything. I kind of got out of it and then I kind of passed everything over to Chad or Digital Infinity now, um, which he can take over after that. So that's kind of like my condensed version of the timeline for me. Anyway. Okay, cool. So you said, so you said you got interested around Halo three, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. And went all the way down the line. Yeah. That seems to be a pretty popular entry point, at least for Machinima stuff. And from Halo two into Halo three, Machinima was kind of thriving, at least for Halo, but we'll get into a little more of the timeline on that in a little bit. But since you kind of led into it, why don't we go ahead and jump on over to digital infinity? All right. Uh, hello, my name is Digital Infinity. I started making videos around three years ago, but I've been sort of screwing around in Machinima since 2007. I started just watching it just because it was something bored. I was like bored and I would just go on Machinima.com because I just found it through, I think, YouTube, I think. And I like the idea of making, you know, cool video game movies with your friends online. And I did watch a bit of Red vs. Blue stuff before then which was, I'm pretty sure, was way established before Machinima. And there's tons of shows that I still actually watch from this day. Like, the John CJG, Digital Fear, is also, like, a big thing for me because, like, he was, like, one of the first things I ever watched. I didn't even discover Steven until, like, three years ago. <laughs> like, I was, I was just browsing YouTube for, like, like, you know, I feel like watching, I haven't watched any Machinima in, like, a long time. I feel like I'll just dabble it. And I found Digital Virus, and I was like, whoa, who the f*** is this guy? And uh, I decided to get a capture card and start to mess with it. Nothing like too amazing, just like I was bored. So I'd be like, oh, I'll try to make some sort of kind of video. And as like the months went on, I tried to make a little bit of stuff that was more coherent and a little more coherent stuff that was, may have been like actually funny. All that stuff is on like private now because I don't feel like putting it on my channel at the moment. And then one day I got a comment from Steven. He just commented and said, hey, here's my Skype. And I was like, well, wait, 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 I just, why, why is this uh, super good editor suddenly just like, you know, contacting me? And he actually pointed out that Spearhead sent him my way. And I was like, all right, cool. And then ever since then, it's kind of been history. And we worked on a few videos together. I think our main one that I'm most proud of is What We Left Behind, which was uh, Halo 2 Anniversary Machinima. And that was fun to work on. And right now I'm working on my own original series with him. And Very that's nice. kind of it. Yes. What's it called? Uh, Black Mamba. Black Mamba. Oh, I've heard of that one. That one sounds good. A lot of people have heard of it so far. Sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, next up on the list, I guess we should go over to the great Isaiah. Oh, sweet. It's my turn. All right. Um, I'm offended. <laughs> I started with... Um, I've actually, Gotta mix it I've up a bit. Watched, I've actually I've watched Machinima since... I think I started with Red vs. Blue. And I've wanted to make Machinima since like... I first saw it, but I don't think I actually started until 2013, I want to say. 
And um, yeah, I grew up. I grew up watching like John C. D. G. Master Chief sucks in Halo and Bruce, a lot of Rooster Teeth stuff. And then um, one day I met my friend uh, Brian, and he made Machinima at the time. And then and he was just like, yeah, it's not that hard. So I was like, you know what? If you can do it, because he's kind of dumb, I was like, I can do it too. So then I just started with a really bad series, and um, I've just kept doing it. I'm like, uh, Digital Virus is like he um, he does like visuals, but I'm not really good at that. So I usually try to try to write the best dialogue I can go into. Um, I'm more of a writer than an actual like director. So yeah, I try to try to make good dialogue. Cool. All right, let's go ahead and uh, I guess move on to John next. Uh, how did you get involved with Halo and? Oh my gosh! I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Okay, well, back in the day, I'm going to take you on a trip. Whoa! There was a man by the name of Higher Octane, who's in a yes. greater place now. Um, Florida. rest his soul. Sleeping in Florida? <laughs> um, he made, he was a part of a group called Euphorian Film, and they were part of the Machinima Director Program. This was back in like 2007. So I watched one of Higher Octane's videos, and I went through like the fanboy phase of like, oh my god, I want to talk to this guy. So I messaged him on Xbox. We shot the sh- played Halo Reach together, and then he brought me to a party with Steven here. So I met Steven, and then they brought Dave into the party, and I met Dave. And, then and he's not here. Um, okay, when I got into Machinima, it was like, yeah, the cliche, back in the 2007, I watched like Spriggs, uh, pregame lobby. Hard Justice, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. And I always, and uh, the Forgotten Spartans was what really like got me like, yo, I want to make those huge <laughs> battles. I never did it though. Uh, I, I, uh, I mean, my, my thing on the internet was uh, me and Steven, oh, throwback, we had this thing called Machinima Box Office where we reviewed all of your garbage Machinima and it was <laughs> awesome. And then we reviewed a Rise of the Spartans episode that we didn't like, and everybody lost their and everybody attacked our channel, and it was awesome. Mike made the greatest video. Mike WB, shout out to the Unsociables, uh, circa 2011, 2012, and beyond. Uh, <laughs> yo, I'm taking you, like, I don't know if anybody else remembers Rolling this, guys. Can no, anybody no, no, no. vouch I, for I me? Remember. No, I remember. Everybody all remembers all of this, oh, right? Yeah, okay. It's great. I'm not losing my mind. No, no, no. Uh, happened. Yeah, Dustin, Michael, this is a great time to be part <laughs> of the Machinima community. It was thriving. I, I know of some of the stuff that you're throwing down. Not necessarily all of I it, made but a some series. of it. Oh, so that's where I was going with this. Uh, Machinima Box Office kind of decided, hey, people are to SJW left wing, so we can't have this show. Um, we started a series on that show called The Odd Spaces, where it was like me, Steve, our characters were like me, Steven, and Higher Octane, uh, and we all lived together in an apartment. And it was like the first, it was the second, like, Halo yeah. sitcom that I've ever seen, because yeah, The Unsociables yeah. was Next a thing before it. And then, <clears throat> it was on Machinima Box Office, and we discontinued that channel, and I was like, okay, well, I said to Steven, if you don't want to make it, I'm going to make it and put it on my channel. So I uploaded the thing, the all episodes that already existed to my channel, and I just continued it. Uh, all of those videos still exist. They're still on my channel. They're private. Uh, each, like, I mean, they're all over, like, 10,000 views. Season 1 is all over, like, 10,000. Uh, season 2 is all over, like, 7,000. It's not that impressive. Uh, I peaked at, like, 2,800 subs, and then I lost interest in Machinima when Halo 4 kind of came out. And, I don't know, Halo Reach was fun. That's when Machinima was fun. And I'm, I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm sorry I took over your podcast. And good night. No, you're good. I, I asked about it, so you're good. Yeah, right now I don't really do much. I just kind of upload gameplay highlights to my channel because I'm literally, I I don't know. Maybe I'll make Halo Machinima again someday. Yeah, you Who make Machinima great again. I'll be the next retro digital. I'll be digital infinity <laughs> beer <laughs> retro. Infinity. <laughs> <laughs> this shit. shout out so yeah shout out the odd spaces the unsociables uh what else is there halo quest hey, hey yeah, who are we yeah, inter- are we interviewing right, then... evan next evan's oh, up is oh, evan oh, up oh, i'm oh, sorry oh, yeah, yeah, evan's up next. Part two? exactly Where is it? no part i don't know where is it okay okay anyway i'm sorry dustin uh no, you're good. Good night. This is uh <laughs> there you go. I hope you I hope you got your answer. I hope you know 
who I is and where I have nobody does throw down what we do <laughs> out here. I, I think I think we got the gist of it. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to make your acquaintance. All right, so yeah, we'll go ahead and move on over to Evan Royalty. How did you get involved with Halo and pick an interest up in Halo Machinima? Well, back in the day, before Stephen Hancock, um, I was a 16-year-old, really stupid Evan, who decided that um, he was miserable being a single, lonely, nerd kid, and the only way he was going to get a girlfriend was by making video game movies. So, <laughs> Preach. So I, um, I, a lot of, I think it's a <laughs> sound sound uh, effort. It's true, though. I, uh, I mean, I'm rolling a capture card and um, <laughs> started making Asking glorious please. 720p videos. And um, they are all awful. Don't watch them. They're really bad. Uh, and work, then yeah. I decided that uh, it wasn't fun anymore, and I started making GTA machinimas. Subscribe. You didn't answer Halo Quest, though. Where, where is it? I don't know. <laughs> well, Evan, that was a very that was a very riveting tale you, you shared with us. You should just so drop everything and riveting, make Halo Quest Part Two. Could have gotten. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it was nice and short and to the point. Very I under, think. very underwhelming, but yeah. Oh, anyway, yeah. so uh, last one I guess in here is Pep. Yeah, everybody wants to hear my story. No. Well, yeah. What do we do right now? <laughs> okay, so. well, um, I started playing Halo around um, Halo Reach. I'm one of those Reach kids. I got into it because all my friends were playing it, and it was the uh, cool thing to do, was play Halo Reach all day. So, um... Still is. Yeah, well... It's for some reason. It's the, best, it's the best Halo game. No, it isn't. I don't, I'm just kidding. Um, anyway, I uh, started... Um, watching Machinima. Before I actually started playing Halo, you know, I was subscribed to Machinima and I would watch the um, RB and the Chief show, RB and the Chief, and uh, I saw Steven's stuff and um, I was like, hey, I want to do that. So I uh, I stole my friend's capture card and I made these really awful videos. Uh, he had a Dazzle and they were in like 360p and they were just, they were trash. Yeah. And, uh, oh yeah. Throwback. I mean, now that I think about it, it was probably my best work. It, it was pretty <laughs> riveting. The story was great. I uh, just kept doing it, and uh, I got better. Not that better, because I'm still trash, but um, a little bit better. And yeah, great, great story, you know? I'm, uh, I'm the best storyteller ever. Nice. We're going to go ahead and move into some of the just kind of general questions I have for each of you guys. Um, starting off with some, I guess, kind of round robin, just to kind of start some discussions off. What's one thing that you wish the Halo 5 had for Machinima tools? A working theater mode. Everything. Mm. I really like it. Should we go one at a time so it's not just everyone yeah. throwing? Yeah, yeah let's, 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 yeah, let's kind of round table this one again. Uh, I guess we'll go backwards order. So, Pep, how about you? A working other, theater other, mode? Other than, other than working theater mode. <laughs> Something else. Uh, split screen. Be mm -hmm. nice. Um, okay. My favorite part of Machinima. Split screen, system link, uh, armor customization that isn't trash. Um, I just said one. This is <laughs> just said one. Just said one. Oh, just oh, one for oh, now. Oh, sorry. One, one for each, and then we'll we'll expand on a little bit later. Yeah, yeah, yeah my bad. Well, no, you're good. If there was like one thing that you like, if there was one thing that you could have in there that you need for Machinima, what what would be that one thing? Um, split screen. Okay. Um, John, how about you? I wish I enjoyed Halo 5, and I wish it looked prettier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you wish there were be better aesthetics. Yeah. Uh, hey John, I'm waiting for you to finish your turn. Next. <laughs> All right, Isaiah? Uh, more dev maps. They have like eight dev maps with cool backgrounds, and the rest are all forged. But I really want to work in theater mode. Do they have depth of field in Halo 5? No. I don't uh, dev know. tools do. They use it in trailers and stuff, but it's nowhere in the actual game, as far as I know. Three four three wouldn't waste their time on depth of field. Yeah, it's too good a feature. Yeah, it's too good a feature. <laughs> All right, um, digital infinity. Uh, well, they they we mentioned the depth of field thing and the working theater mode thing, but I think I'd like it more like minor things to help with making videos. Like uh, like they, we got sort of things like uh, chroma keys, which are super useful. Like, they have no use, really, for gameplay, but they put them in because they know people use it. I would like something more of, like, a 
adjustable zoom so it's not just like you have either zoom in zoom out nothing in between maybe you could Ooh, do like nice like 0. 0.5 0. 0.7 maybe 2.0 zoom just like telephoto lens sort of esque thing going on but i i think something like that would change up the game a little Instagram bit Instagram filters Ooh, we got that already no i know but we need them in theater mode well you need this windows movie maker <laughs> you can just filter everything with microsoft paint and that's all i got okay Okay, and then last to wrap it up, we got there's the virus. What about you? Um, when it comes, I mean, everyone in here pretty much hit the nail right on the head with pretty much every topic. Depth of field was gonna is what I was going to say. Um, but I kind of would have wanted better looking armor permutations. So because everything looks very, um, it's no, it's everyone look nothing. It doesn't really look. I I liked Halo Three. Three's like armor permutation aesthetics. So if they were kind of, and Halo Reaches somewhat. So if they were like if they were able to make like a cross between Halo Reach and Halo Three armor permutations for Halo Five and have the same customizable options, I think that would make it better because then you'd be able to have more freedom when it comes to designing a character rather than only choosing from two pieces to actually show everyone, hey, this is who this person is. Oh, sorry. Right, yeah, it's a new model that lets you do full reach co- um, customization. I don't know if what? I saw that. I think what, wait, 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 what we wait, wait. need for wait, Halo what 5 mod? is just a full release on PC so people could just mod it. Yeah, it, that that would also be a huge um But I know Microsoft's thing. never going to release it on Steam with Workshop <laughs> support. They're just going to do it via their Windows Store, which is going to be dumb. I mean, that's can what they've already done. For that? Like, can you get banned for using Yeah, the... you'll probably get banned for using mods. Well, yeah, game, like cheat. Yeah, game cheat. Game cheat doesn't been doing sure it. Game yeah, cheat does it, but, yeah but, um, game cheat doesn't care. He has nothing. Yeah, but, like, game cheat is probably that smart. Like, like if setting. I do it, I'm gonna I'm gonna be an idiot with it. That's, no, that's all right. I don't want to get banned. And I mean, game cheat probably has some kind of way. Like if they do ban you, then he probably knows he has the way like around. Two thousand proxies. That's almost two thousand one. It's over nine thousand. <laughs> I don't get the reference. Dude. But yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of how. <laughs> That's what I thought. I, I think if they were to okay. bring a Halo Reach and a Halo 3 system back, uh, like a hybrid of some sort, would probably make it a lot easier to make more unique characters rather than the cookie cutter kind of uh, characters that uh, you have to do now. I mean, get, I, I mean, there's always going to be that one guy that's going to get all the souped up armor and be like, hey, this is that generic guy with the really crappy, gritty voice actor. That's their buddy that lives three houses down. I mean, that's going to happen. I usually I mean, play like that character. All of your characters? Yeah, dude, like all of my characters, except they don't suck. <laughs> but something along the lines of that. Hey, Steven, hit me up for voice acting. No. Oh. Nice. I made a female character. <laughs> well, I mean, I've definitely heard the issue with the armor permutations for the mach- from the machinima standpoint with having to grind out and try to get armors that you want to use in there. And definitely I've oh, heard yes, the depth of field that. issue before. Yeah, I'm, there's there's been a lot of talk of whatever they do in Halo 6 they should be able to like change the way that you actually unlock the aesthetics in the game. I'm just mad they don't have other kin genders for the Spartans. Why can't I be Adam, a helicopter stop. kin? Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't my Spartan identify as an attack helicopter? <laughs> See, that is why 343 is a terrible video game company. So non-progressive. <laughs> with, all, with all the other armor permutations, though, I mean, it's kind of a interesting point of just some of the ridiculous ones that they do have in there at least from my perspective yeah i can agree with you on that um i do want to take a pause real quick and uh and invite lane thomas on here who is part of thomas productions hello welcome thanks for having me uh he's been on the show before so he needs no introduction you're mainly focused on halo reach machinima and we've actually kind of already got your backstory already but you have made a halo 5 piece actually for us Specifically, the drop for the operations of light drop stuff. So uh, we're very happy about that. But we're just talking right now about uh, what one feature you would want most in Halo Five Machinima that's missing. Okay, um, I'd probably say playable elites because that opens up a whole range of possibility for having you know like enemies to fight against and um, mm-hmm. and uh, for different characters to come in. So that would be number one on my list. Yeah, I, I kind of miss that there's a lot of machinimas that were made in the Halo 3 and Halo Reach days that can't basically move forward because there's no elites in matchmaking or not matchmaking, multiplayer anymore. Yeah, definitely all those like sort of military, you know, 
Machinima's, uh, you know, there's no like aliens to fight against. Yeah, that kind of gives us a good starting ground to to discuss some of the other stuff that we were kind of missing in Halo Five. So I know at the start there was just a lot of features not available in Halo Five to support Machinima, and then they added the Machinima mode into the game types. And how did you guys find that addition added to Halo Five? Was that useful? Was that something that was kind of hard to fumble around with? I love Machinima mode. It's making it live is pretty cool, um, but there's no theater. So like, if you want to do an action scene, you can't because because it's just like it's really it takes forever to time that. It's really handy for when you're um, sort of working on a smaller scale and you don't have other people in the party you you're able to frame up shots and make sure that you're getting what you want depending on <clears throat> what you're doing so I, I think it i think to refer back to what you guys were saying when it comes to it, it's harder to to use it when you're doing large scale stuff i think that primarily uh depends on like your your, your for lack of a better words your skill set when it comes to doing those types of machinimas like large scale things. So if you're already used to making like, you know, 16 on 16 masked shots and people fighting against each other, like, you know, like the old Canyon battles and stuff from like the old Halo Reach machinimas or any of the scenes from the Forgotten Spartans. If you, if you're, if you're used to working with people and doing that, even in theater mode, then machinima mode shouldn't necessarily be that any different. It's just, you have real time, you have a re- you have the advantage of doing everything in real time where you can talk to everybody and tell everybody this is what I need you to do right here and now and you can also see everything cuz when infinity and i were doing black mamba the first scene is of everyone in the city streets so it was in an, if you have two people in the lobby uh, you can coordinate with each other saying can you see this person where should these people move so on and so forth because if you body act that you you have and you have to go back into theater mode, you have bl- the potential to have blind spots. So when you go back, you're like, oh, crap, I screwed that up. But if you have a, a real-time camera that's seeing everything and you're directing everybody as everything is rolling simultaneously, then you have the ability to fix everything right then and there rather than having to go rally up your full lobby again and do it all over. So I think Machinima mode itself, I mean, it it has some problems, like the camera gets caught on the floor, which I think is stupid. It doesn't glide mm. across it like it, it does mode. in theater mode. Issue, yeah, I, I, yeah, because I, I know that uh, like in all the other Halos, like it did that. I mean, even in Machinima mode, it just gets stuck. Or if it hits something, it doesn't glide or just run down the edge for some reason. But that would be my only gripe about it. But other than that, adding a real time uh, functioning like Machinima mode, I thought was a, a brilliant on 343's end. Anyone else, else want to add to that? No, you pretty much covered everything. Things that would be added was that the question? Well, we were talking about that, but from the from the standpoint of them actually adding the machinima mode as part of a feature set in custom game options, just just kind of your thoughts on on that and the takeaway from that. Um, it was only a good thing. Yeah, I would agree I don't with think that. It really matters because everyone who uses it is still an idiot. Oh. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for lack of better words, on Evan's part, he does have. A point for how things are nowadays compared oh, to idiots. Yesterday. The old sure. generation was better. Ugh. Need some member berries. Member berries, yeah. There you go. So we also have, I guess, in addition to some of the other machinima pieces, we have the forge pieces as well, like the chroma key that got brought up earlier, green screen, and some other forging stuff. And one of the topics I kind of wanted to dive into as well was, uh, what's the effort? that really takes to build a scene or kind of design a scene. So I know Tom French, like on the live streams has really been kind of pushing that some of the stuff that's been added in there has been specifically for machinimators. So if you guys found those extra pieces useful in creating scenes or sets that you couldn't otherwise create in past Halo games or before the updates came out. And if so, what were some of those examples? Well, let me go on. You, the entirety of Black Mamba is, I think, is almost all chroma keyed, except for like that. The entire shot, the first shot and the last shot, we're on the building, is all chroma key. It is one of the best tools I think that is can be used right now because it just adds like so much that Wiggle you could. The chroma key when in Halo Four was like a hundred percent better though. 
No, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. The, Halo, the Halo 4 key, I did like it. I was like, oh, that's cool. They're trying to help. But Halo 4's like art style and engine just had like a weird glow around everything. That I, I being never, sarcastic. never understood. Oh, so if you tried to chroma key, awesome. your character would have like a weird green thing just all yeah, around. Yeah, it had a green yeah. glow to it. Yeah. yeah. So weird. The, but in Halo 5, that is yeah. completely gone because the engine is a lot more cleaner. At least I think it is. At least at the moment, up close it is. Especially on PC. And what we're doing with Black Mamba is we're trying to simulate real cameras and how they work so we try to put imperfections in it which sounds wrong but like like little glints on the camera are added in we're adding depth of field into all the shots that are possible so it can not only does it help just make your machinima just look a little bit cooler so it kind of helps you stand out from the rest of everyone else (laughs) it also helps your like you can use it for actual like you know practical purposes so if you have one character over here that gets out of focus you can help uh di- have your uh, direct your audience's eye towards the point where you want them to look by simply just adjusting everything's uh blur camera blur on screen so it will focus them to a certain point so just little things like that chroma key is amazing and then i would love to see more people implement it because it's not actually that hard but once you figure out it's a beautiful thing and it's it just makes everything look that much cooler. Yeah, the most difficult part is like color matching everything. Another thing I actually yeah. wait, Stephen, let me mention that is whenever you do use chroma key, if you mess up something like if someone else's movement, it's not oh darn, I have to go back and record that. All right, I'm gonna have to do that tomorrow for someone. It's we did that probably three times in the Black mm-hmm. Mamba promo, where one of the characters was walking, and as we're watching, we're going, oh crap, this guy's armor is completely off. So I was like, oh, crap, I have to go back and redo that. We were kind of debating on just leaving it in because we didn't think people would notice. But I was like, wait, no, I can just go back and record. I record. I went back, recorded 12 seconds of a guy walking, and then simply copy and pasted all the settings and plugins that were applied to him, pasted them in, pasted all the plugins on him, and it was done within five minutes. So I could have, I just saved myself probably two hours of work in having to deal with finding someone to help me with it, finding someone with the armor, and did it all myself. And another thing that I was talking about, the color, is once uh, you green screen someone in, they still have the same color that they do in the Halo 5 engine. So if you want them to look different compared to the actual scene, like let's say you're filming in-game, and you know sometimes the lighting can be weird in spots, like you'll be standing somewhere, and your character's a little bit brighter than he should be, he should be more darker. You don't have to worry about that, because you can adjust the color, the brightness, anything of your character right then and there. So all the characters you see, and once again, in Black Mamba, they're all color graded to look as if they fit inside the lighting and the, the scene that they're all in. And that's really that's a really useful tool if you just want your machinima to look, once again, more cinematic and just to represent like a real camera. A big thing to add on to that too is with the, with the supplied tools, like with all of the Forge updates that 343 has released, especially with uh, Anvil's Legacy and with it being uh, ported over to PC, uh, you not only get a huge graphics overhaul, but you also get um, the lighting engine looks a lot better. So you don't get like really bad casted shadows onto like like the chromas, which is what we did in that rooftop scene. We couldn't do it. On Xbox One, because the Xbox One just couldn't power it, because there was we used a lot of set pieces. We had uh, our forgers put it together, um, Cascarab and Treyaz, uh, who are our forgers for Black Mamba. Uh, since the set was really big, uh, like I said, the Xbox One couldn't handle it. But once that they ported everything to PC, and we were using a lot of the new tools that 343 had released with India, the prop lists, your PC is able to handle it better. So then you get not only a cleaner image, but you also get one that's a lot smoother and looks uh, a lot more um, uh, cinematic, depending on like what kind of a style you're wanting to go for. So with having all of those items at your disposal in Halo 5, especially with it being on PC, uh, I think, especially with Infinity and I are trying to do, is kind of push more of like utilizing chromas uh, while integrating it with real like set pieces, but also pulling other um, assets from other games, like other Halo games that you could do to expand your world 
and not only have your stuff stand out from everybody else, but also kind of like um, evolve the way things are done because everything kind of looks the same now because a lot of people are like with what uh, Isaiah and uh, Lane said earlier that a lot of people are going back to to reach because they prefer elites and stuff. But kind of think that like that time is past a little bit because if you're utilizing uh, a lot of the Halo 5's assets to create your own story with just people, like in a, in a futuristic sci-fi uh, storyline, since all of that, uh, since all the older games are going to require you to put in a lot more time to kind of achieve a look like that, to kind of stand out from everything else, because having everything in focus or having everything look like, you know, the guy that uploaded this two hours ago, like you're, you're going to get lost in a pool of content that's always being put out nowadays since everyone has a capture card. So I think utilizing a lot of the tools that 343 has provided us to the the fullest extent, especially on PC, is, is a, a huge thing that they've done. Yeah, and PC, is, I mean, it's still relatively new, but it opens up a lot of doors in the machine the aspect, which is really cool. Absolutely. And plus you have 4K, so if you really wanted to go out and try to do the 4K content. Yes. That is something yes. you're trying that, to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like uh, my our graphics card currently can only run up to 1080. Um well, which is which is fine. Like I'm totally fine with that. Like <clears throat> the textures and everything and the lighting looks so much better on PC. It it is unreal. Is and, there a 4K graphics card? Yeah, if, if, card? No, no, no. If you see so what I use That is, sounds like console peasant speak. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like I, if you upgrade your PC graphics son. card to um, the GTX, the NVIDIA GTX 1080 or the 1070, then you can run 4K graphics on Ultra, um, and you can record your screen with uh, Shadow Play, which is the part of the GeForce Experience app that you get with your NVIDIA graphics card, and that's what we used for the rooftop sequence in Black Mamba as well. So it it doesn't have any uh, compression, so it retains all that detail that 343 has. Uh, given us uh, well, uh, since we're able to play on a more optimized system. There's some new software that OBS put out that is good for that as well. Hmm. It's also free. I use really? Bandicam. If, if you're an AMD kid. Oh, right on. No, that's, that's really great. And like that Black Mamba scene is just it was, it's really awesome. And like, like you said, just, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, even 343 took notice and tweeted that one out. Not many people can say that. I just want to brag for a second. <laughs> I think that's I think that's the second one they've actually publicly ever shown from a cinema standpoint, or or have supported. Dude, I wish I was as cool as you. Yeah, man. Oh, girls don't talk to me yet. I try to put it on my Tinder profile. I don't get any responses though. Dude, same. I think it's one of those things that, and I mean this this is one of the the issues I kind of have with how three four three's done Halo Five stuff and and not really supporting as much community content, but. Like there have been machinimas that have been made since the beginning, and they really haven't acknowledged it, and they're just starting to now. Well, it's well, it's because Bungie acknowledged most of that stuff. I yeah. Mean, like, when when you say uh, from back from the beginning, I'm assuming you mean like Digital Fears stuff or Dark Spire films or Dark Moon and that. Well, I, I was talking about like Halo, from the beginning of Halo Five. Like they didn't even acknowledge machinima really at all. Well. Well, the reason why is because like the content, the quality of the content has like really gone down the drain after uh, kind of like after 2014, like everything really started to. I'd put it earlier than that. Yeah. I mean, you like if you can if you compare like the uh, like the amount of effort when it comes to either scale or editing or like actually going out and finding finding real voice actors. um if you compare like now to let's say 2012, like between 2011 and 2013, like there's a huge difference between that. So kind of everything kind of went downhill after those years. Um, prim- I would I think it's primarily because of Halo Four. Uh, Saying Healy in the chat, I do remember CM near. Remember when he made oh, videos? Oh yeah 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 CM near yeah I remember him. Yeah he he did a lot of he had a lot of cool visual stuff. Who didn't suck back in the day. Yeah. He was kind of, he kind of reminded me of Genetic Spartan as well. I was going to say, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I remember Genetic Spartan. I yeah. Think. Oh, yeah. His stuff was so good. And Teach me how to super bounce. That was right. awesome. Yeah, that was good. 
That's that guy, <laughs> that guy, like, whenever he did anything dealing with, like, um, Machinima, like, he was untouchable when it came to his ability to utilize all the tools in After Effects. Um, which is another thing, like, that, that's, that's how you stand out with stuff. So if you want to get acknowledged by the, 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 the company, Commonwealth. yeah, the people, the people, the people that, pr- that produce the game, you're going to have to put in a lot of effort and do something that doesn't look like everybody else's stuff. You, you right. guys know the Olympia chain? Well, I want to make Rise of yeah. the Spartans, too. Yeah. Calm down, Archangel. Relax. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be so popular, you just wait. It'll yeah, Olymp- 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 Olympia, Olympia, Olympia chain was one of those. Like, it had, like, that graphic novel comic book look to yeah. it. Yeah. And that's another one from, like, the, like, between 2011 and 2013 time time period. Like, 2012, when, yeah. Yeah, like, when around the Halo Reach time was when a lot of uh, big scale stuff was starting to get made because the Forgotten Spartans was just wrapping up then, and Rise of the Spartans had just came out. So I want to kind of backtrack just a bit and wrap up this discussion because uh, it sounds like we have quite a few other areas to talk about as well, which is good. But as far as being able to make stages or make uh, scenes in Halo Five, how is it uh, making it with the Forge system in there, and what? What kind of effort do you guys go through to actually make the stages? Do you draw it down on paper first and then apply it? Do you use some other program or software to kind of make a vision and then you forge stuff in there? Or how do you guys make your own stages? And I guess I'll... I just use GTA instead. <laughs> well, <laughs> forge, all of it entirely. Forge since Halo 5, Reach... Let's see, Halo 4, Reach, and 3. It's, it, pretty, it drastically changes each game. And as that goes on, I become more stupid and I don't know how to use it. So what I usually do is I just outsource to people who know exactly what they're doing. But in that, though, is that something where you come up with an idea of like, okay, I want the scene to look like this. Or I want the stage to be organized like this and then let them build it. Or do you kind of it's give them free It's usually just like I give them an idea. I tell them what details I want and then they can throw it out within a few hours or a few days. Uh, and like, we gave our foragers concept art from Google yeah. for, like, for like a bar. So we needed a bar built. We're just like, hey, we want a futuristic bar. Make it look like this. Um, that's that's normally what we do. We just look up concept art, just send it to someone because the tools in Halo Five are limitless as of right now. It's usually pretty hard to just sit there and like you know, like unless you actually have the scene in mind, like thinking of what you need can be kind of annoying. And like what scale, how big the map is, what things you need to be in it can be annoying. So usually it's just kind of like you just you just free ball it, and then the end result is usually like. Whoa, this looks really cool. This is better than I expected. Thank you. Nice. Yeah, I, th- I think the big takeaway is that you're no longer uh, constrained, you know, by what maps are included. Because now instead of seeing what you can do on like Valhalla or something, you can just make whatever map you want. Yeah. Forge. So I it's mean, very liberating. Some Forge maps look better than dev maps. Mm-hmm. Most Forge maps. Like, like there's some really good Forge that maps That TV map Scavenger. Oh, that looks... Beautiful. What's man. that? I, I have to look that up. I haven't heard of that one. Uh, Scavenger three TV map, dude. It's it's great. It's like this shipwreck. It's awesome. I know. Yeah, I think like a lot of. I think I think just like when it comes to like set building with all of these tools, the biggest setback is that you're confined to the Xbox One, which sucks. But I mean, but yeah. obviously not now because there's a PC <clears throat> port. But with, with being, but not yeah, everybody but, has it. Right, and it's it's it kind of sucks because it's like well you just kind of have to deal with it i mean i think porting stuff to pc or like if you're wanting to go so far as what 343 is trying to do they're basically trying to build a game that's designed to run on a pc not on a console which is why you see so many discrepancies in the visual experience whenever you're playing on console versus pc and that that has to do with like decision making when it comes to how like what chad was saying how big your map is going to be when you're building it because you have to figure out uh how many body actors do we have how many body actors do we know of that can help us on pc versus xbox so that kind of determines the scale of everything because the bigger your map is then the 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 higher up your light map goes and the higher the percentage on your light map is will it will uh kind of mess up your not only your visors but also the lighting in the map itself and whether or not the map's going to flicker or if it's going to lag or any of that kind of stuff. Um, and you're wanting to kind of, if you have a game that looks really pretty and you have all these resources, you're kind of wanting to um, retain all of that quality 
within the tools that they provided you. So that's why like you using concept art for forgers is a big thing for, for us because it's like, this is what we want. This is how big we need it. And normally just telling them PC it's either on PC or Xbox makes a huge difference. Now is, is the PC something where if you, I know you can obviously transfer the, uh, any maps that you make between Xbox and PC. Can you do the same thing with safe films? So we're like you nope. do a, no, not, there's, no, there's, no, there's no theater mode. Is there even a theater mode? Oh. There's no, no. Theater mode in Halo 5 PC, which kind of sucks. But since they included Machinima mode, essentially you don't really need it, which is a godsend. If, if Machinima mode wasn't in it for PC, it would kind of be a deal breaker. What about action scenes? Do you record action scenes on um, Xbox or do you just keep it on PC all the time? Usually at the moment, I just do everything on Xbox that I can. And then if I need to do something on PC, we'll do it. But I haven't really experimented much with action scenes mm-hmm. so i can't yeah. really like comment on that <laughs> but it's not like um noticeable the difference between no, it, and PC. no no um, it, it is it is it is and, yeah and the reason why is because like if you look at players that are like running around that are far away from you and you zoom in they kind of like if the player themselves was to represent like frames they skip around they look like Mega Man from like a sega game or something crappy because the game a compliment. can't the game cannot handle um, that render distance on a console, but on PC it can. You don't get that that um, like I don't know for, I don't know what it's called. I'm just gonna call it distance lag. Um, so if you're doing like super wide shots to try to get 16 people, for example, in a shot, and if they're walking around, their legs aren't going to be you know skipping around like they do on console, like a uh, you know an, an old school Game Boy game. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's a, that's. Hey man, that's the difference. Nostalgic. Yeah, no, right. That's the difference between <laughs> you know jacking around with a console and an optimized system. <clears throat> now, did anyone else have any input into how they make stages or design sets? Oh, uh, well, I, I pretty much know exactly what I'm doing when I uh, like. Usually, I imagine the set while I'm writing the script, and then I, I just know exactly what I'm doing. So another thing I'd like to say <laughs> is that Super Somehow. Cruise. Yeah, that 343 has done right this game is that they've kind of given you more than one palette. So, like, you know, with Halo Reach stuff, it was kind of like, well, what are we going to do? Oh, we're going to do it in Forge World because, like, you know, it's big, it's open, you can, you have a lot of room to play with. But, like, you know, it's like you only have, like, certain textures that you can work with. So everything looks like metal in that game, which isn't bad, but it's like that, that's the resources that you have. So you got to work with what you got. But, you know, everything was gray and blue. Well, Gray and blue, but with three four three, I have to. G- I I just want to give a lot of credit to the to the Forge people because every time they do a live stream, they Tom would just show off, God. They would show off all the little new things they added that are like this isn't this isn't needed at all. Like no one's really going to use this except for small details. But they like look for little things to add because why not? It's fun and like you know they added textures. They're adding different uh, sky boxes. They're and giving you different lighting, weather, all sorts of little like things you can do to add to your map, which probably isn't made with Machinima in mind. But overall, anytime there's like an uh, update, I just kind of view everything as new Machinima assets. And uh, every time they update the game, it seems that they don't really disappoint with adding new things to play with. Um, I also Forge want to mention definitely one of the, things, the yeah. weapons in Forge. I mean, there oh, are yeah, the, there's so many weapons you got. Like not even like rec weapons, but you we have like a Halo Two BR regular BR. We have uh like we have the gunfighter Magnum that looks more like a pistol. We have like a tactical pistol. It's just more like um it's it's great. I mean nothing really else you can say about it. I like some of the new recs that they put in there too, <laughs> especially with the pistols. Those are fun to play with. They definitely have a lot of uses. Like mm-hmm. silenced weapons. They got. Oh, the um, what's the the weapon switching where you make the weapon like um, where you make like, different projectiles like, as, as different assets from a different weapon. Yeah, that's really cool. Have Have you guys been able to to utilize that kind of stuff? I haven't been able to start yet. It. There's we have, I, we have, yeah we have some. Stuff I have in tricks mind. up my sleeve that you will definitely see. I don't think people, I'm not sure if people notice it, but there's definitely a lot of good uses out of being able to mix properties of weapons in Halo Five. But Halo 5, in terms of Forge, it's it's nothing but good so far. That's the only, like, next-gen thing I feel about Halo 5. What, the Forge system? Yeah, the Forge system. That's the only thing that I that I absolutely love about Halo 5. 
one of the other things I wanted to kind of discuss too, I mean, it was brought up as a kind of something that was missing a little bit earlier, but the depth of field. Now, I know a lot of people probably don't understand quite what depth of field means, but um, if if someone wants to take up the realm of explain that to kind of listeners on, on what that means. I mean, I'm, well, I know what it means because I, I do photography stuff, so I know what that... It's going to be a lesson. It's a, it's a field of death. Nice. But yeah, so so like, what is it, and what and what reason would you guys use depth of field, or would like to have be be able to change the depth of field and the focal points within the camera for Halo? Well, in Black Mamba, we sort of just use it, it like right now. In one of the shots, there's a scene where you see the character walking toward, like everyone's walking towards the camera, and only he's in focus. And then suddenly the focus changes so it helps like you know like i said earlier it helps direct your audience's eyes where you want them to look and just can help if like like if if i redid that shot and none of the characters were none of them were blurred none of the background was blurred it would look like a cluster of just crap and it would be kind of hard to look at unless that's what you're going for you want your like you know your audience to be like oh wh- what am i supposed to be looking at here look at all these things moving on the screen it's so dense <laughs> But you know, with every depth- frame has so much going on. <laughs> <laughs> a real OG George Lucas. It's like and, poetry; it rhymes. But with you know depth of field, it just can help so you. Now the give- podcast just got good. <laughs> it can just it can help the exposition of a shot where nothing is even that's said. Not a, that's not how that works. Oh well, I screwed it up. <laughs> how to make a shot look good? Depth it's, of field. It, it how, you how you adjust how you establish a shot? The subject. It so allows you to adjust uh, between so what the audience the is supposed to look at. So the answer to the question is, I'm going to explain what depth of field is. Yeah, well, for any plebs, it's okay. Well, okay, well, I'll do it. Okay, so, I guess I can't do it. You don't know about cameras, fool. <laughs> Unless you do, and you've been I, holding out on me. No, you want to explain? No. Go ahead. No, okay, all right, cool. No. All right, so de- uh, essentially, when it comes to cameras, like depth of field is determined by depending on what lenses you're using. If you're using a photography lens, or if you're using a photography lens it's an f-stop if you're using a cinema lens it's a t-stop and the difference between that is essentially like how much light is passing through your lens to hit the sensor is um in a t-stop if i'm not mistaken and an f-stop is the amount of light is being allowed to go through the lens so think of it as like your pupils i'm pretty sure everyone here has gone to the eye doctor and had if you wear glasses you've probably had your pupils dilated Whenever your pupils get dilated or if they get big, whenever all the lights are off in a room uh, so they can pull in more light so you can see everything. Um, If you walk outside, everything is really bright. It's out of focus because your eyes are letting a lot of light in to your brain. It's the same thing with cameras. So if you have a low T-stop on a lens, so let's say T1.5, for example, that's that means you're shooting wide open and that's going to give you a shallow depth of. Um, so everything's going to be really blurry behind your subject. If you have a higher T-stop, everything's going to be pretty much in focus because you're letting less light pass through your lens. Essentially, so essentially doing that, it, if, you're, if you're used to working with cameras, like you said, that you've done photography before, or you do photography currently, I didn't catch the first part. Yeah, I do photography um, currently. Yeah, Yeah. so, 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 so you know. Um, it basically gives you full control on what you want your scene to look like. And in doing so, you're able to essentially like tell people like subconsciously, this is where you need to look. This is how um, this scene is going to play out. Fucking episodes of The Walking Dead are more entertaining. This than is that. why people don't like you, Stephen, because you're telling people where to look. I'm sorry. You're telling you're... people to just Google it anyway. Yeah. Maybe you should I'm listen triggered. to me, and your stuff will look better. Oh. Uh. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Oh, the field shit. is really good if you want to show your audience that you'll go an extra mile to make something look a little bit more pretty. And get That's re- it. noticed by 343. <laughs> <laughs> that too. All right. Got to stand out, dude. So that's something that could be easily implemented, I think, within Halo. And hopefully <laughs> hopefully it's something that... I, I think 343 has gotten that kind of feedback before, too. Um, I hope that's something that... Well, I know. I'm, but at least... Hopefully, it's something along the lines of maybe them listening to this podcast and maybe down the road, hey, we might consider doing this. Because I've actually gotten asked before by some folks at 343, hey, what Machinima stuff would you like to see in the game? Did you know 343? Yeah. So oh special, God, right? I don't know what it means. I mean, I think Depth of Field is, I mean, that was one that was actually, I mean, when they first asked me, I, I asked a couple of other people, and that was one of the things that was 
asked to be kind of put in the recommendations was depth of field. So I hope that's something that eventually comes around and actually makes it into the game. Uh, what do you guys think of the the map palette for Halo Five? And I know there was a, the, someone brought this up earlier of actually being able to use the Warzone maps. And we talked about that before we actually started the podcast. But what, what are your guys' opinions of the the map selection that's there to use? I mean, I know there's a lot of Forge stuff, and there's some people that have made some awesome Forge content and prefabs. But as far as like the environments that you're able to use and, and create, do you guys feel like you have enough with the Forge stuff, or do you feel like there should be some more natively made three four three environments that you can there use? There is never enough natively made maps. Yeah, I was about to say. This. I Especially think... in Halo Five, it is complete. Like, actually, I will say it's a bad thing. Like, the game has, I think, more Forge maps implemented directly into the game's yeah, inter- it does. than it does actually three four three maps, which sucks. But I lo- I do love the maps they gave us. So, like visually, I will say, and it kind of stinks that whenever we do get like you know quote unquote free DLC, like the free maps that they throw in like every update, like we get the one Warzone map and the one new map. It sucks that whenever I see that, it's uh, just a re quote unquote like reimagination of a current oh, map. God, that is amazing. Nice or it's yeah, what tiny. Was up with that? They did that like, for, for what gameplay. Was up with it can be neat and fun, but as like an actual. I guess product, it's really annoying that they're saying, hey, we're going to give you a free map. It's like, okay, cool. And all it is is just a reused asset of what we already had. Right. Two years to make stasis. Another thing, too. I, I When it comes to the Forge maps that they provided, like some of them are, so like Tidal, for example, like mm-hmm. it's it's huge and it's just all water. Like you can't walk around in any of the water or anything. But like a map, I mean, you could have title, but not like that gigantic because most of the stuff that we do is like is on Alpine because Alpine's um, light box is way better than all the other forge maps because all the other forge maps make your textures look like crap and make your visors like super oversaturated and it just it looks half ass. Glacier, glacier, just glaciers. Yeah, glaciers pretty nice. But I mean, if they made an Alpine map, but like the size of Forge World, but without like the mountains and stuff to where it was just like, like you're kind of in a bowl, essentially. Like you're on massive flat ground, but like it eventually goes up into mountains and stuff. And you basically would have the ability to build your own whatever. So if you want to build a mountain range there, put more hills, you can, which is you can already do. But I mean, if we had more assets like actually placing mountains for example or cliffs big cliffs that are that look natural not just like oh yeah here's this one boulder thing have fun well or you can having, make it look natural well sure but if it's but like well yeah multiple objects but that adds to your light map and that screws up your light box you so see what i'm saying cares about light and, map. um if you want your map to function properly and not crash yeah the the, the map for lucifer but, was was 300 okay <laughs> your visors look fine. Your light map wasn't being was screwing up. So you didn't yeah. have anything to worry about with Lucifer. But if you had a map that size and you were able to, let's say, construct actual buildings, I think building materials would be nice oh. to have. Like in Halo Reach, like they had building pieces. The tab, so you, yeah. Yeah. So if we were able to have like, you know, small buildings or something to construct like plaza for example, like a lot of plazas, buildings or shops and everything would be really nice pieces to have. So then some things don't essentially look like a bunch of, you know, Play-Doh blocks put together <laughs> um, because, you know, for basically the people that aren't very savvy in designing um, super detailed maps, which is essentially what Halo 5's forge system is obviously catered to is the more um, old, like, um, what is it, veteran forgers and whatnot. So, I mean, kind of having a little bit of both while also having a map that allows you to, well, within reason, construct your own would be nice. But more maps designed by 343 that aren't tiny Call of Duty-sized crap maps or reimaginations would be nice. Hey, man, those are my favorite maps. Halo 5 is the best maps in the Halo franchise. I still want to talk about Alex. What I was saying was, what I was going to say is prefabs um, really helped that issue, though, with the buildings and stuff. Like... People mm, who aren't mm-hmm. like that that savvy, you said they can use prefabs now and they can oh, that's they true. build their own maps out of prefabs. You're right. You're right. But also but another thing though is that whenever you put in those prefabs, 
it adds all the objects that that prepad is constructed, which oh, also... I was just about to ask that. Yeah. Well, yeah, 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 but... Because we, I, tr I put in three buildings that were prefabs onto Alpine the other night, and I almost crashed the game. Like, the, the light Shrek. maps... Yeah, yeah, and the light map broke. Um, the some stuff started flickering. Like, the console just couldn't, like, help it, which kind of sucked. Another thing I wanted to kind of ask you guys about, too, was the, the ways you you write your stories are actually right into your machinimas, the different, the different pieces that you're telling. I know for some people it's, it's more kind of comedy versus some other people like with the, um, the black Mamba, that's definitely more of a, a story set up and, and has that kind of more dr drama feel to it. So what's kind of the idea behind some of the, the storylines? And I guess we'll start with the retro digital folks. Well, if you're someone like me and you're a massive weeaboo, I have a oh ton God. of influence from late 80s to mid 90s uh, anime inspiration. So my three like main ones that I want to keep sort of like that I would like to emulate is uh, Ghost in the Shell, Cowboy Bebop and Minor Elements from Akira. All three of those shows sort of take uh, base in a like future dystopia sort of feel or have the theme of bounty hunters and those themes are just really interesting and cool to work with because whenever you have something like a big future city it's there's all sorts of situations you can run into and like uh, cowboy bebop i'm sure a lot of people here have seen it if they haven't it's a good show i would watch it again mm -hmm. I'm to, actually. Mm -hmm. thinking of stuff for black mamba i'm definitely trying to go for that feel like the, the feeling you get when you watch those shows, like they sort of have like a bit of mystery in them and a sort of like surprise elements. Also and they're ones they're, like they kind of, yeah, that's another they kind of have psychopaths, yeah, yeah, yeah. They kind of have slow starts, Avatar? but as the, sh as the show goes on, they get a lot more it's intense. Like anime. They have some, Dude, like, yeah, anime. Favorite anime, yeah. And, and when we when when I wrote Black Mamba like two and a half years ago or something, like I had just finished watching. Cowboy Bebop, and I was that's when I was getting into like you know I like watching like sci-fi anime because of like the the style that they have. Um, and Chad was my main supplier for like different things to say check this out. Um, so some of the characters in Black Mamba are actually modeled after two characters in uh, a show called Ergo Proxy, which is also another future dystopian world. Um, and I kind of thought, what if I took these two characters, made them bounty hunters, and put them in the universe of Cowboy Bebop and Ghost in the Shell? And that's pretty much like what Black Mamba's base comes from. So most of the inspiration for something that's very sci-fi, um, and since most of my stuff is really uh, visual effects intensive, um, that's most of the things that I stem from. Um, same with like live action elements too. Like I look to obviously Michael Bay's work transformers or uh some of his other low-end stuff so like 13 hours the benghazi movie that recently came out is I good saw for, that like two nights ago it's oh is that the one with so james good. franco no. i was surprised at how John realistic Krasinski. it was yeah it's i know dumb but it's also kind of realistic yeah it, and it's when you're looking at like different scales of stuff like it's good to watch the movies or movies by people that have experience in that field so watching things like Star Trek or Transformers or Star Wars. Sicario um, looked really good. Or Sicario for drama or anything Sicario. by David Fincher, like Zodiac or The Social Network. Like those are great movies to watch to build characters off of because Machinima is essentially a visual storyboard. Depending whether or not you're wanting to get into film and media in the future, Machinima is a great tool to start with because that's what we started with. Because I want to make Gazi grumpy. She did do it. Yeah, because like I because I want to because I want to make movies. I want to make blockbusters. So it's a great platform to start on. So mm -hmm. watching movies, or if you're wanting to go for stylistic stuff like anime. I mean, Evan made an, a uh, a video, but way back in the day called uh, it was a Halo Four machinima, and it was like Halo Four anime or something. But it was like the yeah, only then the, machinima then the, that didn't suck. Then the that was based on anime. The, but then the internet gave me a copyright strike, and I took it down. Yeah, it, it, which happened was, to like ninety percent of my. And yeah, and, and a lot of people nowadays like try to replicate like with that super cringy crap where it's like Machinime, come, come yeah, watch see, my sword art online. Come watch my sword art online uh, ripoff thing. It's like no, Never like go try hang to yourself. Think, like come that's, on, that's that's a good source for inspiration. When people try to sword think art of like, online. Ugh. Oh yeah, incest online. You know, you know, I really like <laughs> Infinity Art online though. Infinity but, Art online. Is that one of them? 
Sword but art. I mean, like, and to refer Ranger back to some of like... Evan's stuff, like shards, like there are a lot of there's elements. There's some pretty cringeworthy shards, though. But but there's some elements in there, like editing elements that do shards. pull like inspiration from that, like um, well, anime styles. That's what the uh, the draft scripts were called. They were called shards. Yeah. Nice. We called. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember seeing shards. We did. Um, but it's it's like it's one thing to draw inspiration from something, and it's another to blatantly. Copy rip it, it off <laughs> yeah to blatantly copy it but like in the worst way possible like what like was I, like wasn't like i made a really bad video about elites and then somebody copied it like verbatim and it was absolute cringe even more cringe than the original copy from which they were ripping it off wait wait which one was this uh, who is the was it a sword on online thing no it was because i remember there was something called like sky world online or something which was sword on online verbatim online? it was about it was about elites and it was bad. Well, I well, I guess that doesn't really narrow it down. Yeah, yeah. In, gosh, Infinity mean, World like, Online, Infinity Art Online, dude, there's so many. It doesn't matter. Fucking... It's, it, it, it doesn't matter. It's all trash. Jesus Christ. Um, I'm gonna get so, back to you on that because I wanna, I wanna find that. Okay, so I think depending on like once you find your niche, uh, when it comes to like machinima, so like mine was action and drama. Some other people's are comedies and everything. You should watch films or animes or other like source material that is catered to that so then you can get better at that craft and like look at the way things are shot how things are written how characters act so on and so forth and once you're able to really break that down it will allow you to grow as like you know a director within the community along with your content so that's kind of like how we would kind of depends stuff. on what you want though i mean if you're just in it for fun and gives a f- but well yeah of fun, course yeah but, but if you want to regard anything we're saying Right, but so. but I mean, if you want to consider yourself part of a community, and the whole yes. point is to like grow with everyone, not hold everyone back and stay stagnant the entire time. As long with the storyboard stuff and where you guys get your inspiration from, is that something that just comes along? Uh, you get inspiration, then you try to emulate something, or you kind of try to put your own spin on it. And what what's kind of those little one off things that you really? try to do to make it your own like i get the idea of like wanting to imitate and really draw from ideas but what's kind of the things that you work on to make those pieces your own are we uh going to sorry are we still going down. in order because yeah. you asked like one question to like one person and kind of went with yeah let's i guess we'll go ahead and start with steven you didn't uh, ask any, everyone else the question <laughs> that you did before whatever i don't care i mean when it comes to drawing french from inspiration from different things like I'll be totally honest, like most of the stuff that I've come up with was either in the shower. <laughs> shower <laughs> thoughts, dude. I'm I'm serious. Not even, yep, it's totally yeah, or, legit or just thing. staring or just staring at a wall and zoning out. A uh, primary thing is after I see a movie. So after I would see Transformers again, for example, like especially the third one, which is my favorite out of the series, uh, for the way it's shot during its battle sequences. Whenever I watch it, I'm like, I kind of I would put, I would construct a storyline that I would either A, already be working on, or B, be constructing as I'm watching the movie itself, depending on whatever it was, um, and be like, okay, so I can see this shot being used here, this shot being used there, and then depending on how the characters are or what the world is, like uh, the Deus Ex Machina reboot that I did back in the day, which I regret handing out to somebody to finish, but that the the reboot for Deus Ex Machina was primarily modeled after Dread, the Judge Dread reboot, because it seemed appropriate, but it was it was scaled down quite a bit from like the world of Dread with Mega City One being like super violent and ravaged. I just kind of like took that kind of a world and then turned it around and then mashed it up with Digital Fears uh world of um Salvation City. And I'm like, okay, so how can I make Deus Ex Machina more of a gritty thing? I, Chad and I watched it the other day, and we're like, this is really bad. <laughs> Doesn't mean we compare it from then to now. We can see the. Want to talk big, about who you handed it off to? No, I don't want to. So no, I said it was broadcast, but I was incorrect. No, you're no, you're correct myself. Yep, I'm yeah. going to correct myself. But like that, that's that's one example. So depending on what what I would work on or what Chad will be working on, it depends on the content that we watch. So it's what you, yeah. So it's like, it's what you watch and you're like, okay, I can see this character um, be emulated in its own way in this universe kind of a thing. A lot of things, a lot of things that, yeah, I'll do is I'll just go watch some anime that I'm like, 
I, I'm trying to think of what to do with this character. I'm like, all right, I'll just go watch some old anime to help me think of stuff. Or I sometimes it's a really bad idea. Usually I'll just decide to watch old machinima and something I usually find myself coming back to watching a lot is John C. G. G. stuff because he does a lot of things right. But Especially if you step back, it's, yeah, comedy, that dude is hilarious. Um, He's a great writer. If yeah, you, his writing like, was. But if like out. whenever you're watching his old stuff and you just step back and just like realize, OK, what just happened in this scene? A lot of it will be like, this is ridiculous and stupid. But, you know, back then it was like kind of like that was the, the standard. There wasn't much you had to do depending on like what you're trying to write. But a lot of things he did right. Like if you watch Hard Justice, that is my favorite machinima to date. And I think it stands up like completely good. Doesn't he Wait. hate hard justice? No, he hates one life remaining. One, li- he one life remaining. Everything. One, one life, life remaining, remaining yeah. can be funny. That is one of his like lesser things. I thought if like, I had, the like, first episode of One Life Remaining was really funny. Then it just got absolutely retarded. The, the thing yeah. about I think about John CCG is that whenever he'd write, he would do all his characters were based around how he would act in real life, and he would have his self insert, which would work for certain situations, but like. Hard justice is what really shines the most out of. I think he's like. Uh, I feel like he doesn't. Pl- I feel like he doesn't plan anything. No, that's, his that's world, his, thing. As you're, yeah, his as you're world watching building it. is really good. It's just he can't write endings for. Like shit. as but, you're watching it, you can always tell that it was like, where'd that come from? Like, like where'd that joke come from? It was pretty much just like there's no way that he like wrote this out and it was all last minute things. Especially his endings. Like, if there's one thing he could not do is. He could write a series, he'd put a lot of love into it, and the only reason he'd really end it is just so the audience would have something to, like, have a reference point to, oh yeah, this is where it ends, right here. Like, in Hard Justice, it, they were being, like, kidnapped and about to be executed. I guess spoilers or whatever. It's, like, seven years old, get over it. Like, and suddenly this guy Dude, I was up, just about to watch it. <laughs> yeah, what the f*** is wrong with you? This guy comes out of That's nowhere and just, like, kills all the cops in the city, so they're like, oh yeah, guys. Had the tab open just now? We we gotta we, we gotta be good good old cops again, which like, I guess works because whatever it's kind of satirical at the end of the day. And nobody do sex mocking was ending was horrible. Uh, one life it, it, it didn't it, it wasn't even finished. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like like real ending. That's exactly. And then there was one life remaining where crap hit the fan again. So wow. I remember that. If you're gonna watch his stuff, watch Hard Justice. That is one of the best machinima I think to date. Has and, anyone and, here been watching? Um... Has anyone here been watching uh, season eight of Barbie and the Chief? I have. Um, off. I like. I, I like. It. Got really depressing. It's really well, long. Like it's really. It's only just picking up now after like. Six well, yeah, months. but if you like watch it all in like one sitting or like you know in in like consecutive order, and not like wait like, like months three in between hours of it. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it, like when it when it all comes together, it, it's it's amazing and it, it's it's great, but. I mean, it, the thing that, that is killing people about it is that it just takes, like, a month and a half for each episode to come out, and people forget what happens. And yep, that's, I was just telling someone about that yesterday, I think. I was just like, they'll be like, this happened in episode four, and it's going to lead to episode five. But it's like, episode four came out two months ago, and it's like an yeah, hour, and I don't want to watch it's, that. It's still amazing, though. I mean, like, again, it, it's some of the best, like, well, it's probably the best machinima that I've ever seen. I think really with uh, R being the chief right now, he's not really doing it for his audience. He's doing it more because he just thinks it's fun. That's what yeah. I think he's doing it for. Uh, he's doing it because he has no money. I, I, I believe that. <laughs> no, that's like, sure, that's, that's, sure. that's the reason. Like, he started it for his Patreon and then he, he needed money. His so he's Patreon's like, I'll just... making some mad bank. Yeah, he's, got a, he's getting like $1,000 a month. Poor art student, gotta get by. I'm pre- he, he already graduated. I'm pretty sure what he yeah, does. Um, yeah. He graduated. He, uh... I'm pretty sure he does grip work on sets, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. He does. Yeah. yeah, he always so fails as a liberal arts student. You can always get into politics. That's what Hitler taught me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. It's true, though. But, yeah, I think STEM... Do I think paint. I don't know why they talk to him. I think I think watching, like, uh, things that pertain to the content that you're wanting to pursue in your uh, in your films is a big thing. But when it comes to making something nowadays like i think it's kind of a i think it's like what chad was saying like how justice or deus ex machina things like that like things were that were made the way that they were back then were good for that time and now things are kind of being made the way they were then so it's not very uh good 
So with a lot of people trying to aim high for, I guess, things that, for back a little lack of better words, things that like show large production value. So I guess like machinima blockbusters, for example, a lot of people aren't really willing to put in the amount of work nowadays as they did within like you know the 2011 to 2013 kind of a time frame where a lot of large scale productions were made. And Rise of the Spartans being the most prominent one. Although I didn't like starting this. out now. I mean, over time, it just like people just keep getting worse and worse because the example work that that like newcomers are seeing is the stuff that's coming out now yeah and exactly. so there's there's not a standard anymore like there used to be so black mamba is the new standard <laughs> sure yeah so like if you create yeah so i mean create that term if you no create a, if you create like a new visual standard or like new visual looking stuff that stands out from everybody then people are going to start wanting to go off of that so eventually hopefully in the future like people will look at stuff like black mamba for example and be like I like that. I want to make something look like that. Or I want to make things or a storyline that's similar, but its own but thing, you know, which is what a lot of people did back in the day. I mean, like large scale human vs. covenant stuff was primarily based off of the Forgotten Spartans. And there's a lot of good ones that came out of that era, too. And a lot of comedy and drama stuff stemmed from Digital Fear's work. But like everything advanced and got better. Uh, depending on which generation you came from but the gen the, the new generation now didn't really have that because everyone kind of just fell out of touch with it and everyone for lack i mean uh to be frank kind of turned into a pussy um and didn't like criticism so people everybody's a yes man yeah and people just didn't uh Vote like Trump. Go, You're going to make machinima great again people just didn't like going above and beyond essentially well, to put in the work to or the research to actually make something look good or memorable. What what you were saying about like how people will look on Black Mamba. I mean, some a lot of people won't go to that new standard because it's too much work for them, or See, it, it's just actually, too the, it's too the, big of a task to uh, yep. take down. The thing but, is, is that a lot of little things you can do actually aren't that hard. Like, yeah, it's actually adding, super. Adding, I don't know that because they're idiots. Adding a chroma key and just adding a little bit of blur to your to your character in the background goes a long way. It does, and I, yeah. I, I've, I've gotten a lot of con- like my my video that I like my crap post video I made where I, I I talked about me getting a new helmet. I had like thirty people come up to me saying, "Why does your Halo Five look so much better than mine?" It was I made that video in five minutes, just a, a little a little color correction, blur, and <laughs> chroma key. And people are wondering why my game looks better than theirs. So it's like, yeah, not yeah, hard. The, it's just being able to process implement that's it. Hard. It's well, the process. It's the process. Some people difficult. are very impatient too. Like, yeah, see that, you, but you, you see that's when the they problem. Write something, it's just like I want this to come out. I I want my subscribers. I want my views. I want my you know. So yeah, like, but did, but Digital Fear had the same thing in mind, and his stuff took a while to release, but Steve, people still watched it because. The thing is, you because also got to remember, most of the good directors have already graduated from college and they're doing other. Right, but the thing is, is that if you're going to have I like a, couple years a new ago, generation so. kind of like follow, then you're going to have to keep a standard going, um, because people that are like, well, I don't want to put in the work to it. Okay, then just then don't. Don't say you're part of a community of people if you're not wanting to add anything to it, because that's what kills one. Uh, and that's how it was like before. That's how you weeded out people, because people would wait for John C. J. G. to well, release something. It's going to be very, very difficult because his writing is good. It's going to be nigh impossible to recreate the same cir- like same circumstances that provided for the community that was. You're sure not going to you get can. that again. No. Well, I mean, like how how things work. For, no, for one, no, you had no. to you had to have. This is something I said a long time ago, and it's like when people made Machinima back in the day, they made it because they were doing something on behalf of the Halo community, not because they were doing something on behalf of the Halo Machinima community. They're also doing it for fun. I was about to say, yeah, with no fun. Um, and with doing, Halo Five with its there restrictions, there were flaring egos. Uh, I mean, right now, the reason I'm having more fun making GTA Machinima is because there isn't this collective group of people that's trying to have a dick measuring contest with each other. And nobody knows anybody. Yeah, and yeah. A, 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 the primary thing, too, it's like the 
but also like back then, like the the things were different because the Machinima community was based upon Machinima.com and yes, the and directors. Also had that. Yeah, and the directors that were there. That's that's what basically made you, you had everything director. focused. But um, right. the problem is now is everything's too unfocused to get refocused, and the games aren't popular or interesting enough right now to be passionate about. Of course. Now, if you if you catered it to trying to get like how people did back in the Bungie days to get the developer to notice your content and everything, that would be good. But also pushing a a very harsh visual style, something that's difficult, people are going to have no choice but to adapt to it if they're wanting their stuff to stand out or be noticed, because more people adapt are going to be paying attention. Adapt or be forgotten. People are going to pay attention to a Ferrari versus, you know, like a Honda CRV on a lot. You're going to have to upgrade the way your stuff looks, and that also depends on what you watch and draw inspiration from. I just don't care. I think that's the number one thing. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, I know uh, Lane and Isaiah you kind of, and Pep, you guys kind of have different styles, and I, I kind of want to wrap up on this topic because I know we've gone a little long, but what, what do you guys also have some different ways that you kind of make your own unique content or, or take ideas and then try to make them your own? I guess uh, starting with Isaiah. Yeah, I guess I'll just, if I, I'll watch a lot of stuff. Um, I'm not like huge into anime. I watch a lot of just comedy, funny comedy videos I find on YouTube, and I'll just watch it and I'll be like, oh, what if, what if I did this or this until like you get, you get a basic idea until you just change the whole idea and it becomes your own idea. Or I'll just be watching, like going around in real life and I'll just think something and then I'll write the dialogue for it and then it'll just become a video. Kind of hard to explain my thought process. Fair enough. Uh, Lane, how about you? Yeah. So for us, most of our stuff is uh, sort of like off the wall, uh, you know, comedy stuff. Um, I know for myself, I've sort of uh, drawn some inspiration from, you know, like cartoons and stuff like SpongeBob, stuff that's, you know, like funny, but also has um, some heart to it. So, um, but for like the dialogue and the plots that we come up with, it's, uh, it's a pretty collaborative process with, um, with uh, the other two people in our group, uh, Kevin and Kyle. So usually between the three of us, we can come up with something that's uh, pretty good and pleasing for us to make. Okay, and Pep, how about you? Um, well, I pretty much like writing wise, I uh I take inspiration from pretty much everything that I see in media and I just kinda mash it together. Yep. I mean it works sometimes and because uh wait, let me give me a second, I'm sorry. I'm uh I'm trying to think of something that could you know be okay. be we'll talk take the time to edit this down just for you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> It'll, it'll give him a nice break from all the bleed. Yeah, right. Yeah, so pretty much, like, I, I just take take inspiration. I like um, fast-paced dialogue. I like I like quick cuts, you know? Like, I take inspiration from, like, Mad Max editing-wise. And writing-wise, yeah, again, I just pretty much just try to make it's at least... Complete. Yeah, it's complete and good. I, I don't really know what else to say. I'm sorry. I'm not very interesting. No, it's, I mean, everyone does it differently, so there's no wrong answer to it. Yeah. <laughs> well i really appreciate you guys taking the time to come out and, and talk about mission stuff i know there's a lot of other discussions that we could have and hopefully we can get you guys back on again to, to talk about them because it seems like there's sure. definitely yeah. a lot of- <laughs> this was a huge waste of time That'll be fifty dollars uh how, how's the year of xbox live work for you <laughs> right yeah there you go i think it'd be i think it'd be fun to kind of dive into more of the history of it yeah, and I know talking with some of you guys before actually getting this podcast going, because um, we weren't able to do it on Thursday last week, there's a lot of history behind some of the Halo Machinima and stuff that I think there might be some people that aren't quite familiar with, and there are even aspects of it that I wasn't familiar with, and I've actually been around the Machinima scene since 2007. So, yeah, I think that would be definitely another podcast to do in the future, and something that would I think would have interest from a lot of different people within the Halo community. So. I would definitely like to have you guys back on again to kind of have that discussion. <laughs> it's not fun. Yeah, to laugh. yeah absolutely. Sure. So I want to go ahead and just wrap up the show, but I want to wrap it up with the projects that you guys are currently working on. So I know Digital Infinity is kind of the the more recent big attention that's that's kind of gotten things going for it. So I know that's uh, Black Mamba. So why don't you guys talk about a little bit about that and your plans behind that machinima. 
Um, I'm not sure what me and Steven want to be able to talk about it and what we want to reveal. Uh, I mean, don't don't reveal anything you don't want to. Don't reveal anything you don't want to reveal. But yeah, I mean, it goes through like 20 different people we, for if they want to reveal something, and they have to like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, trying to send it, it down the bureaucratic quite, chain. Yeah. We actually have our our forgers kind of have an NDA sort of thing. Cool with that. Yeah, we uh, we have a total of five episodes planned um, to kind of match up with like you know like how that's almost uh, six the different stages of like storytelling is the uh, we're we're gonna have a total of about five episodes. It's a time consuming process, so it's going to take a while to release each episode. We might re- uh, make all the episodes and then release them all on a weekly basis. We're not sure yet. It it's primarily surrounds our main lead, uh, Ali Fluoro, whenever she has time, because uh, she's currently finishing up school. So that's also another thing that we're waiting for. But all we, I mean, I think what we could probably agree on saying is that like it's there's going to be a lot more visually appealing things to come with Black Mama aside from the promo. I mean, um, yeah, like, there's no doubt in my mind. I think it's like kind of like the best looking Halo Machinima visual yeah. wise, like. And uh, another thing, too, it's we get asked a lot, like, our process oh. in it. Um, layering is, it's a pretty straightforward process. It's Chroma King, and that's it. But as far as revealing, like, how we make our stuff look hyper-realistic, how we color stuff, we're not going to reveal it um, because it's our own unique thing. I think people should figure out how to... Fucking uh, Google it. Well, not even that. I mean, like, it's just we have our own coloring process. We have our own layering process, too. And I think people should develop their own. So their stuff stands out. Come. But you know, I can I can say like I mean it's not something that takes five minutes of work. It's something that is very time consuming. So uh, it's we can't really reveal anything based on the story. It's just what you see in the promo. It's a female lead. Right. Right. Dude, that's so progressive. But what it surrounds <laughs> around is the character Amira, and uh, she's that a bounty so hunter, impressive. and she has her partner Andy, who's an android, an old police android, and. Yeah. They, uh, it's Andy. Andy, the android. Android? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Eureka! Give me a second. I've never laughed hard in my life. <laughs> give me a second to think of it. Yeah, I no. initially get it at first, but then I had to think about it, and then I got and, it. And, uh... God, shut the <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so, essentially, that's the big thing. Uh, uh, we, we noticed that there aren't really a lot of female leads in Machinimas, uh, primarily because most of the people that try to get female leads or any female voice actresses usually use the exact same voice actress every single time. And usually they have them doing like weird, cringy, creepy. So uh, like James Glimm's sex tape, me not yes. sexy. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> so, we, so we, we, we decided, you know what, let's switch it up. Said, a little I want to make like a sex scene too. That's <laughs> we wanted to try to do something a little bit different. We didn't have the whole like, Oh my God, we're so progressive in my, no, which is like, no, wrong. like, right. Not a lot. Not a lot of people wanted to do that. So it's not only like the, the the visual aspect of it that stands out from everything, but it's also like the characters as well. So I feel like I'm being a little redundant. I don't know. What what, what, what do you think, Chad? Do you have anything you'd want to add to that? Uh, Black Mom is going to be the show today. If you want to see something that looks really cool, watch it. That's all I can say. And you can see it on Digital Infinity's channel. Digital YouTube.com slash Digital Infinity. Yes. Slash Brownington. Right? Nope, nope. It it's actually it's actually changed. It's officially uh, YouTube.com. You... you can change it actually. I, I figured it out. Yeah, you, you can teach <laughs> me how to do that. Uh, just Google it. Like that's what I did. How to change YouTube URL. And yes. So okay. yeah. Five episodes. Hyper realistic camera simulation. Best looking thing you're gonna see out there. Humble. Well, no, it's true. I mean, there's a difference not... between being a <laughs> being truthful and. Don't ask us about the process because we're not going to tell you. <laughs> also, fun fact: this was it was originally supposed to be like a five minute short, but after reading the script, I was like, Stephen, this could be like a series. Yeah, so we expanded the universe. But yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay, there's a lot more cool. to the story too. It's not you know generic. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. People may say, um, but, you know, it I mean, also could... was just a promo. So saying that, yeah, oh, it's generic. It's like, okay, well, you're saying that in preview. That's cool. There's a lot more to it to come. So and you'll see that in the trailer that we hope to have out before the year's out. Nice. The great Isaiah, how about you? I know you're working on a little thing called the Halo Butt Buddies. Oh, yeah, I finally finished season Cringe. one of that. So I've been relaxing while I have, have a ton of schoolwork. But um, I'm, I just started writing um, my little comedy series, Isaiah and Brian, season three. So, yeah, that's all I'm working on. A lot of writing. Okay. 
Pep, how about you? Um, I'm making a thing called Promised Land, and it's uh, it's a machinima series based off of the Bay of Pigs invasion. That's pretty much it. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Lane? Any Halo Five machinima you coming your way? Well, uh, not really Halo Five machinima. Uh, right now we're working on a movie of um our series that has been going on for a long time, which is uh, Marlin the Elite. So we're currently working on that, and it's sort of uh ballooned in size and is is larger than we expected it to be. So we're currently just plugging away on that, and that's with uh Halo Reach. Okie dokie. All right. Well, thanks guys for coming in and sharing with us some of your machinima stuff and just kind of the way that you do machinima and some of the um the great things about halo 5 machinima and some of the not so great things about halo 5 machinima um i hope to have you guys on again i know there's a lot of stuff that we didn't even touch on tonight that could easily be discussed regarding how to actually produce the cinema and how you guys uh actually develop the stories and behind it and actually come up with editing stuff and even going back as far as talking about Halo Mission and history. So hopefully that's something that we can cover again in the future. And I'd, I'd really appreciate to have you guys on. But I think everyone who's listening hopefully knows where channels are and Twitters. But just in case they don't, you guys mind plugging your stuff? So I'll go ahead and start with the Digital Infinity folks. So Twitters, YouTubes, all that stuff. Say again. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I thought you were, I thought you were going to add on to that. Uh, Digital Infinity's Twitter, I actually don't know. Let me look it up really quick. My YouTube channel is just YouTube slash uh, Retro Digital. You can look me up by either typing Digital Virus as well on YouTube or searching up Dawn of the Titans, anything like that. Or if you click or if you look up Halo Machinima on YouTube on the front page, you'll see Dawn of the Titans, which I think is like the fourth one down. And you can find my channel through there. My Twitter is Retro Digital oh one i'm not really active on it but you can follow me on my facebook page which is just digital virus if you search it you'll see my emblem chad's twitter twitter.com slash digital infinity except the first i and infinity is a capital l and i don't know how active he's in there but yeah or lowercase l i'm sorry and his youtube channel is youtube.com slash digital infinity and you can also find him in my sub box and vice versa okay cool isaiah how about your stuff uh, my YouTube channel is just youtube.com slash C the slash the great Isaiah. That's with an A and the the and then Twitter is the same thing. Okay. Lane. So my personal Twitter is at Lane Thomas. That's uh, L-A-Y-N-E. And then um, our YouTube is just youtube.com slash Thomas Productions. Nice. And then Pep. You can follow me on Twitter at underscore Pep, Pepsi underscore. And uh, my YouTube channel is YouTube dot com slash t new age entertainment i need to change it all righty cool um so for those of you who are listening to us uh live we're going to be playing the miles interview after we shut down the show so if you guys want to stay on and listen to that you're more than welcome to for those that are downloading us via the show it's going to play right now So I'm sitting down with Miles Luna, who is the uh, storyboard writer and I guess kind of lead producer on Red vs. Blue for Rooster Teeth. So welcome to Pottacular, Miles. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, currently, I guess my title would be uh, head of story for Red vs. Blue season 14 and I'm, I'm head writer of animation at Rooster Teeth. All right, cool. I know the titles have changed a little bit, yeah. so thanks for clarifying that one. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah i figured it would be cool to get you on here we had we've had gus on the podcast and bernie on the podcast before so this is a, a nice one that i've actually been very interested in having for a while because of the story aspect of red versus blue which is kind of one of the um reasons why i got interested in halo was the story of halo and then red versus blue was really interesting just kind of the way that the original staff took that idea and went with it but since its inception has gotten a lot more story driven, which has been really fascinating. So I'm, I'm personally very excited to talk to you today. <laughs> well, I'm glad because those are two tough acts to follow. Yeah. I, I, I don't envy you one bit. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say. So, um, we customarily on our podcast, whenever we have someone new, we kind of like to discuss their background a little bit. So you are, you came in to do, I guess, a story with uh, red versus blue and you've kind of, uh, your role has evolved since then, but, 
how did you get involved with story writing? What was kind of your education upbringing and, and how did you get invested into doing something like Machinima with Red vs. Blue and really pulling out a story out of something that really didn't have much story to go with? Um, well, I guess in terms of like telling stories, I don't know. I've always liked entertaining people. Um, like, you know, whether it was theater and skits and stuff or uh, drawing comics when I was in middle school all the way through college. So I don't know. I've always I've always liked to entertain and, and storytelling is something that is uh, something that I think is a whole lot of fun. It's, you know, it's a cool journey that you get to go on with the listener, or the viewer. And and I don't know, getting to spin that tale is it's, you know, it, it's creatively it's very satisfying and and fun to do it's a fun little little puzzle i guess but um you know my my background you know really in, in high school i i learned that i wanted to go into television somehow I, I took a video tech class in high school and it just it opened my eyes to this unbelievable storytelling medium uh, i knew i wanted to make cartoons but i didn't know exactly what that meant did i want to be an animator a, a director a, a writer i, I didn't know I didn't know what I wanted to be. I just knew what I wanted the end result to be, which was having a hand in making cartoons. So uh, when I got into the University of Texas, I essentially uh, started doing my best to cast a wide net and start learning about all the different skill sets I believed uh, were necessary in creating a cartoon. So I took a uh, 2D animation class. I took a screenwriting class, a directing class, editing class, all that stuff. Um, I'm, I'm kind of whittled things down from there. So for like the first thing I learned was I am, I am not an animator. I, uh, I just did not have the patience for it. It was very satisfying when, you know, you would finish an animation and, and all that hard work paid off, but boy, sitting there and, and, you know, creating something at 24 frames per second was who it was, it was tough. And I have an immense amount of respect for animators after experience that, experiencing that firsthand. So I, I, I could scratch that off my list and then. You know, I did some editing and some things here and there, and I took a writing class mainly just because it seemed like something that would be fun. Uh, when I think of a writer, I, at the time, I didn't think of that as a realistic career choice. Um, you know, when I think of a writer, I think of somebody that works out in Los Angeles bussing tables, and maybe every now and then, if they're lucky, they'll get a script sold, and then someone will pay them for it, and then go off and do whatever the hell they want with it, and that's that's the end of their journey with that script, and they go back to bussing tables until their next big break. And to me, that you know, that's not 100% true. You know, obviously, that's not the case with everybody. But that was kind of the nightmare that I had. And I, I always thought of writing more as a hobby than necessarily uh, uh, something I'd be doing with my life. But I took a, a intro to screenwriting class and I had a lot of fun doing it. At the end of the semester, my TA strongly encouraged me to sign up for the advanced class. So I did. And then after that, I had another great time in that class. And my TA for that class strongly encouraged me to start submitting scripts to um, local competitions, uh, Austin Film Festival, things like that. And uh, I was like, oh, neat. I'm not terrible at this. <laughs> but uh, Turns out you're really great at it. <laughs> well, uh, uh, so, so I, 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 I was thinking about doing that, but then I was also taking you know, some editing courses and other production-related courses. And um, one summer, I was, it was about that time where I needed to go ahead and get an internship. And I had applied at uh, Nickelodeon, at Cartoon Network, uh, made it to the second round of interviews for both, but ultimately um, didn't make the cut. And I was really bummed out. Those were the places I'd always kind of imagined myself working um, because that's the kind of stuff that I grew up on. But uh, by this time, I'd been in Austin long enough and uh, I'd, I'd met Brandon Farmahini in uh, college um, and it, he had invited me to uh, serve as a production assistant on a few live action shoots for Rooster Teeth. I'd, I'd gone in every now and then uh, to help, you know, sort some files or edit something or, you know, carry sandbags. Like the first ever uh, production I helped out on was the doom immersion. Oh, nice. And I'd gotten to know, you know, some of the guys there and I had, uh, I'd become a fan of red versus blue in college. Uh, so I thought it was really cool just getting to work with these guys and kind of see what their day to day is and see if I could learn as much as I could. And uh, he mentioned to me that they had an internship position open. So I thought to myself, well, I, I have nothing to lose. I, I need to try and learn something this summer. So I applied to be an intern there and uh, I got the internship. And uh, my first task was doing machinima uh, for Red vs. Blue season nine under uh, Carrie and Bernie's guidance. And uh, I did a lot of audio editing and again, file sorting um, and a ton of just little odd jobs. I sorted props and costumes, um, you know, would go and run errands for people. And I did that for a while. And uh, it wasn't until, gosh, I guess 
late that summer, we, uh, you know, at the time we had a uh, contractual obligation with Microsoft to uh, every several months we would deliver a, uh, a mini series uh, done in Halo for their uh, Halo Waypoint channel. And um, okay. at the time, everybody was so busy. Uh, you know, there was the it was around the time of like the first RTX and, um, you know, there, there was shorts and immersion and, and everybody was doing something. We were, you know, it was a much smaller company back then. I think I was employee number 19 when I finally got hired. Wow. It's what in the seventies now? No, we're over, uh, 200. <laughs> um, Dang. essentially, uh, nobody had time to write a mini series. So I asked if I could volunteer and everyone said, yeah, sure. Why not? So I wrote the first episode of a mini series called where there's a will, there's a wall. And, um, and, uh, Bernie really liked it. So he said, Hey, uh, do you mind writing the, uh, second and third parts to this? And I said, okay. So I gave it a shot and, you know, he gave me a few notes here and there. Um, but after, after it was all said and done, he said, these are great. Uh, do you want to try directing it? And I went, oh, okay. Uh, so then I, uh, directed those three episodes with uh, a lot of Carrie's help. And by the time that was over for a while, I was, uh, I was working in the uh, graphic design department and I remember there was a day where um, our vice president, president of the company pulled me inside and said, Miles, you need to make a decision. Uh, you might not be aware of this, but you can, you can essentially uh, make a choice here. Would you like to continue working in graphic design or would you like to work uh, on red versus blue? And I said, red versus blue. Then uh, Bernie asked if I'd like to help him write season 10 of red versus blue. And I, I helped him fill out a lot of the uh, machinima portions of that while uh, Eddie Rivas was uh, helping write on the freelancer end of things. And, uh, and it, that went over well, I learned a lot. Um, it was nice. You know, I wasn't writing the entire thing. I was only writing some episodes here and there doing punch-ups here and there filling in a gap here. Um, and it went over really, really well. And I remember I went to a barbecue sometime after 10 had ended and Bernie just casually asked me, how would you like to, how would you like to run red versus blue and, and write and direct season 11? And you really only have one answer when Bernie Burns asks you <laughs> if you want to write and direct Red versus Blue, and that answer was yes. And that's uh, it's essentially uh, it was in the right place at the right time. Nice. Now you mentioned when you were back in college that you did a lot with uh, like writing stuff, and then you looked into getting production. Was there any other piece of production that kind of piqued your interest other than writing, as far as uh, filmmaking or uh, I guess creating content goes? Yeah, I really enjoyed editing. I, I thought editing was a lot of fun. Editing, it's it's you have all these puzzle pieces and you need to figure out how they all go together. Uh, oddly enough, uh, my least favorite thing that I did in college was directing. Um, I hated directing, and directing still it, it it stresses me out a lot because um, you know I'm I'm a person that works really well if you give me a task, like if you give me something to do, I can I can figure it out. Like it gives me structure. I say okay, by the end of the day, I need to try and have these things done. But when you're the director, you're the one not necessarily handing out assignments, but but when people have questions, you're the one that everybody goes to and you need to have an answer and you need to be able to communicate your idea effectively to a large group of people. A mentor of mine in college, Dan Knight, told me that you know the world is filled with millions and millions of people with ideas. Everybody has great ideas. What's difficult is finding a person that can have a great idea and then communicate that idea to people and make it happen. Um, and that's what I've, you know, he tried to teach me as, as a director and what I try to do uh, but it's very hard it's it's directing is definitely the most stressful aspect of my job um i, I greatly prefer writing um <laughs> but you know uh it can be very fun it's it's i do love getting to work with a team like writing i mean depending on the on the property i'm working on uh, it can be a very solitary experience where you know it's just you and a blank page for hours and days and weeks um but you know when when you're in the director's chair it's a blessing to have five minutes to yourself, you know, like uh, Carrie's going through it right now with Ruby volume four, where uh, I can't tell you the last time that guy had a lunch break. He just carries around a sandwich with him and will eat it at some point in time when he has a second. Um, it's, it's very extraordinarily time consuming. It sounds like it sounds like it's a very, very tough commitment too. Yeah. Cause essentially you're, you're, you're running around all day. First you need to talk with, okay, does editorial have any questions? Does compositing have any questions? Do animators have any questions? Does layout have any questions? Does modeling have any questions? Like you are constantly. And then once you get through everybody, sh surely by that time of the day, somebody in another department now has a question again, or needs your eyes on something or needs approval. So it's uh directing is, is just um, really more than anything. I feel like it is a constant flow of conversation. Um, you're constantly trying to keep everybody, um, focused on on making a coherent piece of content so you know you not need to make sure that 
the music is fitting the tone and the visuals are fitting the tone and the actors are, are, are hitting their marks. That's something I do enjoy. I do really enjoy vocal direction. Like that's a much more simplified process. It's just you, the script and the actor in the booth. And, and that is, it's much more intimate and you can kind of take your time with it. Um, but then when you're directing an entire piece, uh, it's, it's, it's constant interface with everybody. Gotcha. When you were in college, did you produce anything that's, that was kind of noteworthy or anything that you're really proud of that kind of led you into the career <laughs> where you are now? Oh man, in college. So, so school, whether it's high school or college, like that's just where you go <laughs> to make mistakes. That is, you get all your mistakes out of your system. So then hopefully you have fewer mistakes when you get into an actual real world job where you can, you know, get fired or something. Uh, I made a ton <laughs> of bad student films, like terrible. I, I, I could not watch them again because I'd be so embarrassed. Um, but the two things that I did do that I, that, that helped tremendously were, uh, I worked at Texas student television. It was, it was a volunteer TV station that was student run. And, um, I met a few people there, including Brandon Farmahini. And we, uh, produced a video game show called video game hour live. That was a half hour of reviews and industry news. And the second half hour was broadcast live over antenna, uh, in the local Austin area. And, you know, nobody really watched, but it was still exciting. You know, or it was exciting knowing that somebody could tune into their television and see us playing games. And that got me, you know, it, it, it was, I didn't really do fraternities or anything like that. TSTV kind of was my extracurricular family. And uh, I, I met a, ex, tons of extraordinary people. And what I love most about it was, you know, uh, the College of Communications at UT as well as at many colleges is extraordinarily competitive. You know, everybody wants to be the next Spielberg or Scorsese or whatever. So in a classroom setting, it can be pretty cutthroat, but at TSTV, you know, even though everybody's working on different shows and whatnot, ultimately everybody's stuff is going on the same channel. And if someone else's show looks like shit, it's going to make everybody else look like shit. So there was a suddenly a, a huge amount of incentive to help one another rather than compete with one another. So you'd look at somebody and say, Hey, Hey, I don't mean to interrupt, but you know, it would look a lot better if you did this or like try using this technique or, Hey, do you need any help with this? And it was a much, much more, uh, there was much more camaraderie in that environment. Um, so being a part of that was, was wonderful. And then, um, for video game hour live, I, uh, after I watched rivers blue and was a big fan of that, we were trying to come up with new segments and I came up with a segment called the noob corner. It was supposed to be just be like a short piece every week where you would take a, uh, uh, like a nerdy terminology, like back then, like elite speak wasn't as lame. Like nowadays, if somebody talks in elite speak, you're like, shut up, Jesus, what year is it? Like back then, it was like, oh, like the term noob or pwn, um, things like that, spawning. Like what did, what did those words mean to somebody that didn't really play video games? And it was supposed to be explained in a kind of uh, humorous fashion. And I was like, oh, what if we kind of machinimate it? Like there's a show called Red versus Blue that uses Halo 3. It's really easy to do. It's like poor man's animation. Let's do that. So I made these four episodes of a machinima called The Noob Corner. Uh, that just had me and my friends in it, and uh, it was not very good. It wasn't very funny, but it did. I, I it did get me used to using Halo Three and uh, that whole process of Machinima, and because of that, Brandon identified me as a potential intern uh, to help out on Red vs. Blue Season Nine. So because of all those just extracurricular things I did, um, that's that's how I got my foot in the door. That's really cool. So you really had that interest in video games before even getting picked up by Rooster Teeth. Oh, I'm a huge nerd. I love video <laughs> games. I'm a, I'm, I'm a terrible film student. Uh, I don't watch a lot of movies, but uh, I could talk to you for days about video games. Uh, so what's your favorite, I guess, other than... Ooh. Or I guess, is Halo your favorite? Or is uh, it something Halo, else? Halo Combat Evolved is probably my favorite overall video game in terms of story, uh, uh, presentation, gameplay replayability, like all that stuff. It's, it's probably my favorite. Um, and nostalgia certainly helps. Um, it was like, God, right. I just, I, I, I actually just finished replaying it again this past week for who knows whatever, how many times I've played that game. I know just about every enemy spawn point in uh, assault on the control room. Oh, geez. That's and impressive. Just, as a kid, uh, all my friends had playstations. I was the only one with an Xbox. So whenever people would come over like the th like two favorite levels to play were assault on the control room and the silent cartographer. So I have played those levels probably easily over a hundred times because my friends would always want to play them. So I, I, those two levels in particular, I know like the back of my hand. Um, my personal favorite level is probably either the mall or mm, yeah, no, I really like truth and reconciliation, but um, that's a good one going, going, going purely off gameplay though, probably the super smash brothers franchise. Like that is just like, 
man, you can just pick up and I can play that for hours. If, if somebody will fight me, I will play. And oh my God, I just, I love it. I love that game. It sounds like you had a few LAN parties back when you were attending university. Oh, yeah. Left for Dead. Left <laughs> Dead uh, another one of my one of my probably top five. Awesome. No, that's really cool. I think there's a lot of interesting ways that we hear about people getting into the gaming industry and especially something with like Machinima. So to hear that you really had that interest that kind of matched up with now what you're doing. Because I hear a few times where people are like interested in one thing, but then they get picked up into the video game industry, not quite thinking it, was, it would apply to their, their talents or whatever, but then it works perfectly. And you mentioned that you were interested in doing cartoons, and now you're doing cartoons with uh, Ruby and animated stuff with Red vs. Blue. So it's, it's really cool to see that what you were looking for if it's, was exactly what you got with Rooster Teeth. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it seems like a cliche thing, but you know, every closed door is just another opportunity to open a different door. Had I gotten those those internships at, at Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network, I'd either be in Georgia or California, probably still doing script coverage because you know you, everybody is wanting to work there. And um, but the beautiful thing about the internet and about Rooster Teeth is you know it kind of gets rid of the middleman. And if you have good ideas, you can just go straight to the internet. But you know that's why YouTube is unbelievably like there, it's impossible to watch all the content uploaded to YouTube. It is physically impossible because anybody can do it. Um, and if you're, you know, now that makes things rather difficult because there's now a sea of noise out there. How do you stand out, you know, and, and sometimes it's just the right person seeing your video. Um, Rooster Teeth, fortunately, was, a, you know, pre-exists YouTube. So they already have a, a strong uh, foundation online, a strong online presence. You know, they're you know, our own website, roosterteeth.com. Um, and now that's, you know, that is essentially roosterteeth.com is our, is our broadcast channel. You can go there for whatever. And, you know, it's, I've, I've been in the company now it's crazy to say this, but five years and I got to help write and direct uh, the camp camp, which is, um, you know, exactly the type of cartoon I wanted to make as a kid. And I got to do vocal direction on that and writing with that, with uh, Jordan Swears, Gray Haddock and Kay Shawcross. And that to date is probably the proudest thing I've worked on just because it's like, it's like, wow, this, this happened. I still can't believe it. And, and then getting to work on red versus blue and Ruby and, all these other exciting projects. It's just that never, I never would have been in this same position had I not failed to uh, get those internships at those other two uh, companies. Yeah. And now you're, you're living your dream basically is what it sounds like. Yeah. It's a good time, man. I'm very fortunate. Yeah. That's really cool. So uh, I guess a little transition over to some rivers of blue specific stuff. Um, so you, you've been writing since uh, you said uh, 2010. Uh, season 10 was the first uh, season I wrote on, yeah. Uh, season 10, yeah, okay. And since then, I guess the first the Blood Gold Chronicles was kind of like a loose story, and then we started to see a little more story kind of dig in. And I think, what was, what was it, around like uh, season 7 or 8 where they started doing animation? Uh, yeah, season eight, season 8 was the first animated season, yeah. So how's it been with mixing in animation with actual machinima and it's kind of really prevalent with this season and i have another question about that because this season is very different based off of other red versus blue seasons that we've done but how has that integration with the animation and the machinima been as part of uh writing and directing uh well from a writing standpoint it it it, it opens up a lot more you know prior to animation really the only like writing for machinima made me a lazy writer because every scene would be like sarge runs in of course he does. That's that's what Sarge does. He can then also crouch, jump, shoot, hit, and talk. That's really all. The, all of your verbs are buttons on a controller with Machinima. But with animation, you can have Griff shrugs his shoulders, or Simmons kicks at the dirt, or Tucker, uh, you know, drops to his knees. You can get so much more emotion out of animation, and of course, you can do uh, incredible action sequences. Um, but personally for me, like that was season 12 was, uh, uh, the first season I got to write for with animation because I only wrote for the machinima in uh, season 10. Okay. But, uh, that, that to me was, was so much more exciting. Not the fact that I get to write big, crazy fight sequences. I mean, those were fun, but the fact that I could have a character emote in a way that I had never been able to show before was so much more exciting to me. Okay. And it sounds like a lot of the stuff that's, that's transitioned with um, the animation where they started just doing animation within the machinima and now it's completely broken out where you have 
specific animation scenes. Like we, we saw the, the three with um, Felix and mm, uh, yeah. Locus. Yeah, Felix and Locus and how they kind of got their start from being good guys to bad guys type of thing. But then you have the purely machinima aspects. And then throwing in there, we have the the one episode that had the mega blocks. We had the one episode that featured the 405th. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had the one drawing from Caboose's Guide mm-hmm. to Making Friends. So you have, I mean, I think this season has been the widest exploration of mediums mm-hmm. out of any Red versus Blue season so far. From a production standpoint, it's definitely been one of the the most ambitious. Uh, we were actually recording DVD commentary for it today, and uh, Cohen, our producer, pointed out to me that we started production on this season exactly one year ago from this month. This has probably, I think, been the longest production cycle for a season of red versus blue. Um, and that's because really, when you think about it, say we have, I can't remember the exact number, but say we have 18 different contributors, right? That is 18 different productions, all umbrellaed underneath this one title. But really, you know, every time that we use a different style of halo for machinima, that's a slightly different pro- uh, process because, you know, for example, halo one and two, those don't have theater mode. So you have to get a different production process for those. Um, a live action piece that's a completely different production pipeline. Caboose, completely different production pipeline. Mercs, Mercs alone, those three episodes, months and months and months and months and months of development, creating assets, uh, figuring out how we were going to use the lighting, how we were going to, you know, changing the aspect ratio. Like it has been a tremendous undertaking that Cohen begged me, can we please never do this again? Because <laughs> it's also <laughs> just communicating, you know? Getting, making sure that we are constantly communicating with Freddie Wong out in LA, that the game grumps are all on board, that, you know, people that aren't, we can't just go to the person in the office next to us and talk to them. We have to have an email chain or a phone call or a Skype call. Um, the amount of organization necessary to make season 14 happen is horrifying. And I, I, we could not have done it without our, our producers. That's really cool. It's uh, from a creative standpoint, I've loved it. You know, it's very hard after 13 seasons you know, to keep, to keep things fresh. And, you know, when I wrote, uh, the chorus trilogy, um, the plan at one point was that that was going to be the end. Like we were going to end with the, the, as fans call it, the cliffhanger of, of season 13. Um, and I thought it was a beautiful ending. Um, but you know, uh, we all talked about it and, and fans just wanted more and more and more. So, you know, we said, okay, we'll keep, we'll keep going. Um, but we weren't sure what to do. You know, we never want to put out anything that we're not excited about. We want to make the type of content that we would go home and just watch anyways. Um, so we found ourselves in a dilemma where we had these characters that we loved in this universe that we loved, but we didn't have a story that we wanted to tell with them necessarily. We had stories that we could tell, but none that we were very excited about. So that's where the idea of an anthology came up is, hey, you know, we've been essentially just making like Halo fan fiction, right? And then I was a fan of Red versus Blue and then became a writer for the show. What if we just kind of opened up our toy box to our friends and, and, and partners online said, Hey, you want to come play with our red and blue toys? So reaching out to the grumps, to Funhouse, to Freddie, um, to friends like, uh, you know, Chris Roberson, early Ernie Klein. It's like, Hey, you guys want to come just tell a story in our universe. Um, and let's just do whatever we want. Like, like the mercenary trilogy is so far and away from anything we'd ever done before. Stylistically, tonally, it's just weird. And, that's because this was really one of our only opportunities to do something like that. We did an entire episode in Mega Blocks. It's like, it's absurd. So this was really just our season from a creative standpoint to just kind of play, just take these characters and do whatever we wanted to with them and not worry about continuing a storyline or the repercussions of a past season or anything like that, but just kind of have fun as storytellers. And I think you guys have done a great job of it too. Oh, well, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. And being able to kind of go back and see some threads in there, like, Watching this this season, it never really dawned on me that Tex was an AI <laughs> uh, until until watching that. And now I have to go back and watch the in, entirety of Red versus Blue, and and with that in mind now. So thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta find the time to binge watch that. Um, but yeah, and I think it's been really cool to see this different style of Red versus Blue, and it's always been something that it's kind of moderately changed over time after the blood growth chronicles we had a few mini series and then we had a, a trilogy that started to take shape of an actual story an actual backline and then we had um everything with the chorus trilogy and um the freelancer project all the season that really focused on that so it's been really interesting to see 
what kind of started out as as a fun machinima thing really build into this universe within a universe. <laughs> it's certainly been a, a, a long evolutionary process. All we hope is that you know people will always be entertained and, and we'll continue to have fun making it. Right on. So there's uh, one more episode for this season, uh, like nineteen. Uh, no, we have several more. Um, I don't know the exact count. Um, but uh, normally we'll do like nineteen or twenty episodes a season with four PSAs. But because of the structure of the season, we don't have the four PSAs, so we still have a we still have a small handful of episodes left to go. And it's, is there something kind of down the line for a season fifteen, or is that still kind of being discussed internally of of whether or not you want to pursue that, or if you want to start another kind of storyline, or is that still something that's being tossed up in the air and, and trying to figure out where that falls? Well, as of right now, season 15 of Red vs. Blue will be happening. As to what that season's going to be about, we're working on it. <laughs> Very nice. All right, well, we've hit our 30-minute mark, so I want to thank you for your time and really appreciate the work that you've been doing. And, and for me personally, I've, I've really enjoyed the story that's been kind of fleshed out and being able to watch some of the episodes and not quite know what's going to be happening next has been been really fun and, and fascinating for me. And I think I can speak for a lot of the listeners who will be listening to this that they they really enjoy Red vs. Blue and all the work that you guys have been doing. Oh, well, thank you so much. We hope you guys keep enjoying it. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you for being on. And uh, I know I'll run to you, in, into you again at conventions and hopefully we can have you on the podcast at some other point in the future. <laughs> right on, dude. All right. Well, thanks again. Yeah, anytime. (laughs) That's it for this episode, everybody. Thanks again for tuning in and downloading this episode. We have quite a few things that we took out of the first show for the download or the first part with the Machinima crew just because of some of the discussions that went on that weren't quite on topic. And as you could tell by the number of bleeps already, there was some other stuff that we uh, pulled out. But I wanted to just kind of level set some expectations for the podcast. We had these guests on, uh, some of which we kind of vetted beforehand, some of which we uh, didn't that we were uh, asked if they were okay to bring on, uh, that we didn't know weren't specifically Halo Machinimator. So I just wanted to kind of apologize to our listening audience for not vetting that clearly beforehand. And also just kind of for the duration that it's taken to edit this podcast. I know we recorded this thing about three weeks ago uh, and, and from the release of this show. And one of the reasons is uh, just from the amount of time that it took to edit this show, it took about six to seven hours to edit this podcast. Um, but, I mean, no particular fault to the guests. Um, I did say that it's a family show, and I, I, whenever I have guests on that use kind of strong language, I don't want them to act unnatural. I want them to kind of be themselves. I don't want them to have to put up a facade or anything. So I kind of took the hit on that with the the language and the tangents that kind of went above and beyond what we normally are comfortable with on the show. So I edited a lot of that stuff out. Um, so I just kind of wanted to level set that with you guys and just uh, just thank you for downloading this. I really enjoyed the time I got to interview Miles and then the other machine maters on this show. And I just uh, really want to apologize again for the delay in getting this out to everybody. With that said, I would encourage you guys to check out the other podcasts on the podcast network that we are a part of. Critscast, Guardian Radio, Work in Progress, The Learning Cliff, and How to Murder Time. And then we also have Podcast 76, which is the Overwatch podcast that's built off from Critscast for those that followed it. I'm not exactly sure if it's officially tied with the podcast network, but it's done by the same people. So I'm guessing there might be some loose affiliation there. So... Feel free to check those podcasts out. You can head on over to thepodcast.com. That's podcast with a K. Or you can go to podka.st and find them there as well. And also check us out on our social media. We are on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitch. If we have it, podtagler.com slash whatever it is, and it will redirect you. Again, thank you everyone for tuning in to this show. It's been episode 555, and we will see you guys in about a week.